I'd like to call a meeting to order. Thank you. Um, any addition or changes to the met to the agenda? Nothing. Okay. Thank you. And new business number one: set the date for the budget re revote. Before we um, start, I'd like to just review our Morristown Select Board rules of procedure. Um, just a few, of, just three of them. Um, comment by the public or members of the body must be addressed to the chair once they have identified themselves and not to any individual member of the body or public. Members of the public must be acknowledged by the chair before speaking. Members of the public must introduce themselves prior to speaking. If a member of the public has already spoken on a topic, they may not be recognized again until others have first been given the opportunity to comment. Members of the public shall be afforded a maximum of two minutes each time they speak on a topic. All right, and we're, we're going to uh, allow people to speak out. No, it's mentioned twice on any particular topic. Is it germane to setting it's the date for the budget it, it, vote or what I just read? Just, just, yes, it is germane okay. to that. Uh, if you don't Can mind. Can you introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Tom Clutia. Thanks. Sorry. If you don't mind for tonight to suspend that two minute uh, time limit, uh, th this is kind of important for, for us to be able to express our opinions and what's going on and for you to respond. And I think that if we're making a point to hear the damn alarm go off, it's very distracting and I don't think we need it. I don't think there's going to be any problems. And, and this is a, a, a time for us to have a, a, a discussion back and forth and limit it to two minutes. It really has no, uh, you know, purpose really other than it's shutting things up. And I don't believe anybody's gonna stand up here. But it would give us an opportunity to everybody have something to say because that's really, really important tonight. And if you would just probably suspend the two minute and, you know, fight to this beat. So. The pleasure of the board. I don't have a problem with it. Honestly, um, I think that everybody knows that you don't need to be eternal to be memorable. Um, we can make our points, but I, I don't have an issue with suspending it if, if, it's, if it's on task and not repetitive. Okay. Don? I guess my first thought was going to be let's see where things go and uh, give people their two opportunities to speak for two minutes, and then we'll see what's left over. Uh, there are a lot of new faces in the house tonight. And Maybe there are a number of people that want to speak. Okay. I certainly have no issue. Um, I, I'm hoping that um, people are going to bring some great suggestions. So um, I would ask that you stay on topic um, and to keep us moving. And since this is a specific meeting for budget, I certainly have no problems. I could go along with it. If we keep, keep it to the topic and keep it brief, because I think in two minutes people should be able to express themselves. That would be good. Um, so because we have a lot of people with staff here too, we don't want to prolong their hours being out here too. I, I, I think how long it lasts tonight really doesn't matter. This is a, this is really important. Thing. I understand and it that. and it doesn't have to be the last night for a discussion either. It's still very important. Yeah, right. I I agree. So the first uh, item on the agenda is set the date for the budget revote. <coughs> Uh, Sarah, did you want to speak to it? Would you like to us to speak, talk about it first? You guys talk about it first. So okay. All right. Questions. So Sarah did send out several different um, timelines here. And obviously we're bound by a couple of different events. Perhaps the most important, getting the taxes out, the November 15th deadline. And... Um, so just so the, the public knows, we're looking at a table right now here that gives us various dates to sign the warning. July 17th, July 24th, 31st, August 7th, and August 21st. That's, those are important dates because um, petitions would have to be signed for anybody running for office at the same time. We would have to have informational meetings before that. Um, I'm sorry, after those dates. On election day, if we went, let's say, with uh, 
July 24th is our warning that would put us at August 29th for an election day. And we've had conversations about waiting till the end of the summer, waiting for school to be back to give the most number of people as possible a chance to vote. Um, rather than during this during the summer, of course, we wait later. It just constricts things and gives us less time going forward. Gives, in particular, the town clerk less time going forward to uh, do all the town clerk's office to do all that they need to do to get ready for the election and be able to prepare taxes to be sent out. Um, so election day, it gives us time for the 30-day petition gives time for the town clerk to set the tax rate, prepare and mail tax bills and property taxes, which would be due November, uh, November 15th. So those are all considerations. There's only two dates that I've mentioned. If we warn the election on July 17th or July 24th, we can meet the November 15th deadline. If we wait till July 31st to warn, we don't meet the November 15th deadline. So, in my mind, it would make sense to try and get the November 15th deadline if we can. You know, so I, it, it, yeah, the public's used to it, uh, taxpayers are used to it, that would make sense. So, I guess I would, if there are ramifications in going, if there are, are few ramifications or none or some or lots after November 15th, I guess we should hear about that. That would be my, my suggestion, to choose one of those two dates, either July questions. 17th or July 24th. I have questions for Sarah, please. Our authority on all things election. Um, I guess my first question, given the current situation, um, what dates, will all of the dates that you gave us accommodate um, the election process for select board members? Yes. Yes, so that's what, um, on the timeline I gave you, that's the, it's actually would be the same day of signing the warning, petitions would also be due that day. Uh, and so, so if we did a, uh, a warning date, any petitions for elections or any petitions in general would have to be in? Actually, I, I petitions for candidates, not petitions for articles, those, if there were, additional articles to add, those petitions would have to come in ahead of time because they would need to be on, on the warning before that. So if they were articles, they would be a few days before that. I, I didn't think to add that to the timeline. Well, this is just the petitions of officers so would be on we, the same day. If we were to do the um, July 17th, mm -hmm. when would the petitions for candidates have to be in? July 17th. Yeah, it's too tight. Yeah, I think that's and you too need, tight. And you, need you need 30 signatures to run for a um, I would office. agree with you, Laura. I think July 17th is too tight, too. Yeah. So while you're at the microphone, <laughs> what are the ramifications of going beyond November 15th? Um, so it's not just the town to consider. I know that you're the select board and that's your, your main interest. I, not only do we collect town taxes on that day, we also collect the school taxes on that day and we collect the village taxes on that day. Um, the school, we, um, I have to pay us um, 20 days after collection. So I think if you go a little bit after the 15th, I think I would hope that they would have cash flow. Um, if you're talking a month or so, I would need to talk to the school because they're expecting um, payment from me 20 days after. November 15th is what they budget for and they do their cash flow analysis. Um, I'm also the village treasurer, so I can tell you that um, we run, the village runs um, the whole calendar year in deficit, so we, they have approved a budget, they have approved the November tax date, but the town collects all of the money for the village and the town doesn't pay the village until like the first week in December. Um, so the village, we just, we run with no money. So um, I, I would, I, the village would need to have money by the end of the, the calendar year 
in order to pay um, so would we not everything. use the line of credit to keep to pay those um, we can't default uh, you, isn't that what the line of credit is for um, yeah it's or not a line of credit oh. it's um, th there's it's very little money that it, it, we're talking like a thousand uh, eleven thousand dollars to the village yeah, okay. it's just okay. I wouldn't have collected the money in order to pay mm -hmm. for that um, I don't think uh, we wouldn't have enough money to pay the school that's like four that's or five right. million dollars and we don't want to borrow that much yeah we don't want to so it sounds like the school is school is probably the issue. I mean, I think you could potentially do the the first two scenarios. I'm I'm assuming uh, the all right. I guess it's the the scenario of uh, an election on September 6th or a September 12th. Yes, you missed the November 15th deadline, but. Um, in one option, you miss it by five days. The other one, you miss it by uh, twelve days. Um, I, I would, I would hope that the school would have enough money for a week or twelve days if we were that late. Honestly, I don't think um, we should push it any uh, time past that. Sarah, what's the reason on on just so you know on our table if we go with that third scenario? The election would be Wednesday, September 6th. We're not used to elections on Wednesday. No, Tuesday. So, so um, the, one of the biggest no-nos is to schedule an election the day after a holiday. Yeah. Um, it's not even recommended to do a holiday week. Yeah. Just people aren't people aren't anticipating. Even though we will be mailing out ballots because that's what we did the first time, they will have their ballots way ahead of time. It's it's just not in their mind. Elizabeth spoke to somebody this week that told her that um, it just they had their ballot, but they uh, they were going to fill it out, and it just slipped their mind. It wasn't in their normal process of when an election should happen, and so they 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 forgot to come turn it in. And a lot of people go on vacation holidays school will be in session then so it sounds as if the August 22nd scenario is a no possibly that's you're thinking that's too yeah that's, that's pretty quick oh, the, um, the first one I would think yeah. that the July 17th is way too early yeah way too early yeah, okay. that, yeah. you know July 24th we can't rush this. Uh, allows us to make our November 15th Deadline, if that kind of assuming that the budget passes, uh, for us, um, I concur with Sarah. I think September 6 is probably much less ideal moving forward. Um, I think also it's how her office can handle um, yeah, this, nice. and it appeared from my. August 29th worked out the best in one uh, vote as well. So I, I think that we have a task at hand to put um, this budget together so we can sign a warning on July 24th and uh, have petitions in by the 24th and move forward with that date. If something goes sideways for us um, and we're not there, we have a default date, but I think that August 29th ought to be our selected date. And just so everyone knows, it's awkward sitting in the audience not looking at this table, I know. Uh, the August 29th that, that we're talking about would be uh, sign, signing the warning on the 24th, and that would allow us to have the election on the normal November 15th day. Not election, tax bills. Tax bills, tax bills. yes, sorry. The August 29th the date that they're throwing around is the day of the election. So if we're actually having the election or the uh, budget vote on the 15th, how soon will Can you repeat that? So if we're having a budget vote on the 15th, <clears throat> when would the I don't I don't understand the 15th. With You're talking about this. Yeah, that's what we were doing. We're talking about the watch should be the 29th. Okay. All right. Than um, 
tax bills would be due on November 15th as normal. Everything would be normal. Okay. All right. Thanks, Jenny. Um, okay. Um, I think so. I think it, yes. Do do a motion. Are you ready for one? Yes. Yeah, I think we are. Laura. Um. I guess I have to be. Well, no, we can do a discussion. Well, discussion. I think I, I think it is what it is. So yes. And there's okay. always this one too. Maybe. I would make the motion that we go with the second scenario, which would make election day August 29th. It would also mean that we would sign the warning for the election on July 24th. Petitions would be due, due July 24th. Judy, I'm just reading it off here. I know you're probably having a hard time keeping up with it, but informational meeting would be August 24th. And property taxes would be due on the normal date, November 15th. Do I have a second? I'll second that. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? <coughs> Just looking, that gives that gives our residents basically a little over 15 days to get petitions in to run. Yeah, 18 days. Yeah. 18 days. Yeah. That's right. Just curious, you know. Uh, I don't know what our, I mean, I just don't know, think that we have options here, that's all, you know, I just. Oh, we could go with this one, which pushes it out. I mean, I, it yeah. seems as if we could go, nothing set in stone. Nothing set in stone. I think, yeah, it, yeah. I'm sorry, I just, I just don't want to rush this. This is way too vital for, you know, and I don't want anybody to feel rushed, and nor do I want, you know, candidates to not be able to have time um, to get their petitions in and run. So, but, you know, I don't want the school to not have money. Well, you would send out, would you send out, I shouldn't say you would, would you send out a tax bill for the village and the school if the town did not have an approved warning? I don't know about that. The village has an agreement since the 90s that um, they basically hire the town to do it all. So um, I, th I th think that it would cost the village more money to mail their own tax bills and process it than, um, than, it, than they're going to collect in money. So I can't see the village um, doing it. And I don't know, I don't know with the school. I don't know who's, who would pay for that either. If it's not the school's fault, it's uh, the burden is on the town, so I don't know if it's, I don't know. The, the guidance I got from VLCT was a little gray, but it didn't, it sounded like um, we were not obligated to do a separate billing for either. So um, if we proceed ahead and we find out when, what is our last date to change our minds? Is this it? Well, yeah. uh, I guess your last date is the day you sign the warning. So you can make okay. a motion today, but you're not, you, um, I don't even honestly think you need a motion. I think it's more you're giving me guidance what to do okay. and we can plan. But really, when you sign the warning, that's when you're setting the election. Okay, that's, uh, I just want to, because we just don't, I don't know how it's going to go. <laughs> so, but, but you need given, to get. But given yeah. your comment, I mean, we we need to let we need to give the public some idea of what yes, might be understood. for yep. the petitions. Understood. Yep. So I think yes. I think okay. one of the things we're saying is one of the things I'm saying anyways is July 24th would be the earliest petitions are due. I for one would not renege and go to the 17th. Understood. Okay. Yes. I'm good. Okay. Oh. Oh no. Right. Okay. Can you guys just speak a little louder into the microphone? They're having so, problems here. So yeah, you know, when it comes to, we need to let the public know that um, July 24th would be the earliest that petitions would be due. You know, for us signing the warning, you're right, that's not all that okay. important, but to let the public know that they have less than 24 hours to get their petitions in would not be 
No. Not be okay. wise. That that happened with COVID. Mm. So I guess the war you know, the information's out there to the public now that there there are Well, that's article number two on the agenda today. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> don't don't start yet, Don. <laughs> okay. Stick to the agenda. Okay. Well, the other, okay. The other piece of this is that should a third budget fail, and we have to do this all over again, you know, what happens then in terms of billing for the school and the village? Because certainly the town is borrowing money as tax anticipation, so to speak, uh, to operate, which is usual and customary to receive tax payments on November 15th. Um, if this budget failed, um, what kind of jeopardy does that put the municipality in, in terms of potential default, um, but also its obligation to the school uh, in terms of collecting taxes and payment? So I think that. Mm -hmm. scenario before yeah. not kicking this can too far down the road to um, you know hope, hopefully it will be successful but on the other hand um, I think we need to look farther down the road to make sure we can meet all the obligations. Is that a question or a statement? <laughs> yes. You're looking at me and I'm not sure what the question is. I was, I was thinking out loud to see if it was <laughs> Um, I think so. <laughs> well, I just, I'm concerned yeah. about where we're heading for November 15th and our obligations, yeah. you know, the relationship with the school. I think right. covering $11,000 out of uh, $2 $2.2 million that we borrowed um, shouldn't be an issue, but it's the it's this whole school component. I, th I think how it's written is that we have to pay them 20 days after we collect the money. I th but they also... They set a budget, they have the cash. Would you be willing to reach out, kind of clarify with them, mm -hmm. just because we don't want to put ourselves or the school in jeopardy in any way? That's mm -hmm. right. And they have a brand new finance director, too. <laughs> Welcome so, to Warsville. Yeah. yeah. yeah As of like a week. Wanna... That would be great. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure what she's up to speed with. Or, or not she just started yeah so it sounds like we actually don't need a motion but it sounds like we did or, a motion uh, we did a motion but it seems like we're all in agreement um, is that true am I speaking out of line here that we're looking at the agreeing to the uh, August uh, 24th August 29th 29th sorry yeah the 29th for election day right. so yeah. do we, we have to rescind the motion <clears throat> yeah I would concur that this is you know, this is by consensus. Um, it may be fluid, so if we make a motion, we'd have to rescind the motion down the road. Yeah. It absolutely didn't work out, so you could rescind the second, rescind the motion itself, and it would just be by consensus yeah. that that's our target date. That's much better. I'll rescind my motion. Okay. I'll rescind my second. Thank you. Okay. okay. All right. All right. All right. Wait, but by consensus, we're looking at the 29th. Yes. Okay. Yeah. You have a question? Yes, I do. Tell us your uh, name. Bob Ortry. Uh The $2.2 million that was borrowed from the Union Bank, where does that lie in terms of default if this does not happen? Where, what, is, what is the payback date of that? And is that the operating cash that the town is now running on? Yes. I'll help. Tina might need to help with some of this, but um, it's due on June 30th. And it's something that we do every year regardless if we need the money or not. Um, we didn't just borrow money this year because we don't have a budget. Um, we borrow it and as a municipality we are able to invest it. So we borrow the money to invest it and then we earn money on it. So that's really why we borrow the money to make money. If that is due back? It's due back June 30th. So we have a year, a little less than a year, 2024. Yeah. And, and we have to keep vote, voting, voting on a budget until we pass a budget. Thank you, Sarah. Oh, go ahead, sir. 
Jan Paris, uh, when do the tax bills get sent out so people will know what their bills are for the 15th? So that was part of what we were just trying to discuss with setting the election. So typically they are mailed out by the end of um, September by law. I have 30 days. Um, you have 30 days from when they're mailed out to collect. We typically send them out six weeks in advance. This year it will be depending on when we set um, the tax rate. Oh, Laura, can I have my paper back? Yes. Disregard my notes. I didn't write anything <laughs> nasty. So if, if the board does stick with the election on August 29th, then tax bills will um, be mailed out between October 3rd and 15th. Thank you. They would set the tax rate on October 2nd <coughs> because there's a 30-day um, appeal process if the budget passes. Or if it failed and people wanted to revote it too. I'm sorry, Bobby. Keep quiet, you Tom. Please. Again. I, I'm a little confused here. The, the election is that for the open select board seat that are we going to vote for? It and there's not going to be anybody uh, chosen. Is that what that election we're talking about, or is it? Kind of jump the gun. Yeah, I, I kind of yeah. yeah. So, so what are we talking about here? So, it's for I, the I budget, but it could be for that as well. Could okay. be for both. Oh, okay. Okay, we ready to move on? Yes. <laughs> yes, because everybody, everybody's curious. <coughs> All right, number two, discuss vacant select board seat. Sorry, I forgot to check to see if there are questions. Okay. All right. Who wants to start this discussion? We have, an, we have a vacant seat available, and we're talking about how to fill that seat. Do well, we have it? My understanding, according to an email we received today, that if we do have a vacant select board seat, well, we don't have to do the, oh, the vacant seat right away. We don't need to do the vacant, oh boy. We have, we have two things going on. We have a vacant select board seat, and we also have a select board member that was appointed. And according to an email that we received today, the appointed select board member would need to be, I'm looking at my town clerk right now, would That's need it. to be elected at the very next election whether a town meeting or a special election but I, I believe so I that's that's my interpretation of of um, what I read from VLCT is um, if somebody's appointed then they're appointed typically through the next annual meeting but there could be a special meeting in the mean meantime it's until the next election and because there will be a next el special election then I think that yeah, yes that posi the appointed position should be voted on at that meeting so as far as you know Sarah do we don't need I'm not saying that we shouldn't by any means but uh, <laughs> we don't need to fill the vacant seat then so we could and again I'm not saying we should but we could wait till March for town meeting According to VLCT, when must a and exactly what forthwith means when interpreting statutes, court aimed to implement the intent of the legislature and will presume that it is intended the words, which can be taken from the dictionary, Black's Laws Dictionary defines forthwith as immediately without delay or directly promptly within a reasonable time under the circumstances. Going off to what I'm <laughs> guessing that's what it is. We're, we're working on it. We're yeah. on stable internet right now. We are working on it. Those that are on uh, Zoom, bear with us, please. 
yeah. um, as we try and get this straightened out. We're in and out, and I don't know, it might be the heat yeah. that's yeah. causing the unstable yeah. internet. Let's see when um, she's back up and Yeah. yeah. Right. Judy, are you back up and running? Uh, I, I Let me just, yeah, I'm back. Okay. We should have everybody so, wave at us if they can hear us. <laughs> So I'll, I'll, I'll say it again. Um, my seat was the, to fill the unexpired term uh, for Bob Beeman, which his term was going to run out this coming March. Um, and the, uh, the recently um, vacant select board seat, um, that appointment, if we appointed somebody, it would be until March. Um, if we had an election that con was concurrent with the uh, budget vote, it would be for the unexpired term of that vacancy. Um, my suggestion is, is that we do them both at the same time, understanding that whoever uh, fills my seat that I'm currently holding would have to redo that again in March because it would be the unexpired term but the other seat would be for the unexpired term of the recent uh, vacancy. So my suggestion is, is that you do both at the same time. Uh, and I would agree, um, because I think everybody has to remember that as soon as this budget passes, we start again on the next year's. Um, so it's um, going to be very important having um, five select board members and more importantly, having people uh, that have gone through the election process uh, I think is really important at this point. So I, I absolutely believe we should do both. And then the fact that it rolls over. So we're, we stop the uh, topsy-turvy that's been happening. We need consistency. I'll, I'll be quick. I, I agree. Uh, we're having an election. Let's, let's, let's get do the election done. Let's, let's fill, this, fill this board. So should we put this in the form of a motion? And you can pick up petitions from um, Sarah for candidacy. Just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, I was going to speak to that once <laughs> I figured out what you guys, in the discussion part. Um, they're also on the website on the town under clerk elections, and there's a thing about candidates, and there's petitions on there all the time. So if you are not thinking about these positions, if they vote to do this, but you want to run at town meeting, you can already get your petition. You need 30 signatures. So I would make the motion then that the vacant seat on the select board right now and the seat held by appointment right now, that those seats be voted upon at the election. Maybe just say special election. The special election when we <coughs> vote on the next budget that it all happened at the same time. Yes. I would second that. Do I have a motion and a second? Any discussion? I have one hand up on Zoom. I'll get you, Tony. Sarah. Thanks again, Sarah. Um, Kathy? Your information um, I lost, I you lost the internet, so yes. I, I'm, a, I'm a bit confused. Okay, so, can you identify yourself to us? I know. Oh, sorry, Kathy Chafee. Thank you. Um, I, I didn't hear it all, and it's very hard to hear Chris. Um, are you there? I think you froze up. Okay. <laughs> I can see you guys all froze. <laughs> um, so are we going to vote on um, Travis's and Chris's select board uh, position on this next vote? That's what we're. That's what we're currently uh, deciding on. Okay, we have a motion just, to. Right. You just made a motion for that. Okay. I was just. Yes. I was in and out of internet, so I really didn't hear it all. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, Tony Cody, Cody Hill. I think I agree with Don. We should move towards a town manager and three board a three board uh seat here we don't need five if we got a town manager and i think i think three is plenty thank you thank you can can i just uh tony the problem with um three is that we have to have a quorum so if somebody decides to go on vacation um we can't have uh votes 
which delays things. That's the downside to three. And then if you have four, it gets split to two. So that's the reasoning behind the five. Um, just a little background there. Tom Anders, you want to make most of the decisions here? Uh, no. Well, that's we need to review that and discuss it. But yeah, I'd like, I'd like to know what that's the another manager does. that's another conversation. Thank you. So I'd like to know what the town manager does versus an administrator. We're gonna that's coming. Yep. So, any other discussion? Will Spalding, Cody Hill Road or Fontaine Hill Road, um, longtime resident here in Morrisville, forty-one years. Um, homeowner for 37 of those years, 12 years on the school board. Hats off to you guys. In time, you've, this year, trying to reconcile things, get a budget passed. What little aid, you might as well be considered volunteers. Um, <clears throat> so, um, I, uh, in addition, uh, think it's it's great that we are going to try to get the public to vote on two seats, appointed seats. And if you could just clarify, uh, Travis, the recently resigned select board member, his term ran through? 2024. Uh, four. years. Got it. So he had a three-year seat. So we would be voting. He only had two years? Yes, he's oh, a two-year seat. He had a two-year seat. Oh, okay, sorry. So we would, be, we would be voting on the person uh, who runs to uh, fill out the balance of term of Bob Beeman through this coming March of 2024? Correct. Yes. And Travis' seat through March of? 25, actually. 25. Okay. So I think that's important yep. for everyone to understand mm -hmm. uh, so that when folks get their petitions, pick them up, yeah. they know what's what. They know what their sentence yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I also hope um, that, um, that, that folks um, bring a, a, um, sort of a, a spirit of cooperation and thoughtfulness um, to the, the process, uh, understanding what tough work this is, what tough economic times we're in. Um, nobody wants their tax bill to go sky high. The town has to run. The money needs to go to the school. The money needs to go to the various departments. Um, we have an obligation as residents of this town um, to, to step up and, and try to be thoughtful and collaborative and respectful uh, through the process. Um, it's the first one of these meetings I've come to. Um, I regret that. I wish I'd come to some others, but it seems like it's been, it's been lacking, the, the sort of collaboration and, and respectfulness and uh, the, um, that folks would hopefully be willing to compromise and see things from more than one viewpoint. Um, so again, thank you for all your efforts, town staff as well. Thanks. Thank you. Alex Sear, um, just because it's been mentioned that there are some two-year seats and some three-year seats, I was wondering, is that sort of a permanent state of affairs? Is the town sort of transitioning from two to three years or, or in reverse, or is, or is there some particular reason why that's not the seats are consistent? Yeah. So I don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. There's always a mix of two and three years so that not too many people are getting off the board in any one year. Thank you. And some people only, you know, want, only want to do a two year, a three year sometimes is a, a tough sell, so it's, it's to give you options. We have a motion on the floor. We second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I hope we remember what we're voting on. <laughs> <laughs> budget we discussion. Can watch the video. <laughs> uh, budget discussion. We have to untable our budget discussion. I need a motion for that. Go ahead. Go ahead. I would uh, move to untable um, our uh, untable the discussion for budgets. I have a motion. I have a second. 
Uh, I'll second. I'm sorry. I That's okay. Any discussion? <clears throat> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Now we can move in budget discussion. All right. So who would like to start? Um, well, we'd like to get some feedback from the community on um, thoughts about the budget and we have, I don't have it in my head, exactly where our budget stands right now, but it was uh, considerably dropped from 28.6, was it? Something like that. Something like that. <laughs> I think we've forgotten. To down to possibly well, and it was voted down, but the last was 12.6. 12.6, and that was without talking about the common level of appraisal, which gets kind of sticky because people don't really understand what that means. But it would have brought it down to about maybe under 10. Yes, that's what we were figuring. So the budget that failed the second time would have been um, less than 10% uh, increase. And again, I am not an expert in how to explain this, but it, the ten, let's say it's 10% because it's round numbers. It doesn't mean your taxes go up 10%. So um, I know that, that, that Sarah and Tina have worked on putting together calculators on the website so people could figure that out. So that's what I would like to stay, start with. Can I ask a question as, uh, as to that budget now is slightly different because we've had inflationary things kick in? Is that Correct. The twelve point six. So would that be this? It, would it be the same, or do we have we there, had things that have affected it? That there are some ideas that I have that can um, affect that twelve point six. There's been some staff that have come and gone. We have a lot more um, concrete figures that we can basically use last year's figures um, to to you for this budget, and we couldn't before. So it's more. Um, I think I think it's more precise. Okay. So I have a few ideas on that end, but I haven't been instructed to do anything. So. Okay. Yeah, I'm just wondering, you know, because we now have. It, I think you answered my question that we have some better ideas of how the inflation is uh, directly affecting us, so that we, uh, because we were projecting before, so we do have some more solid numbers. But just and maybe you can't answer this. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. But How about coming up to the microphone uh, here. Um, no, wait. Tell tell get, uh, given um, given everything that's in there currently, we're still looking. The budget that we have in place right now that was voted down is still around a little over 12 percent uh, increase. Is that true, or? Well, it it is true, but it doesn't take into account the new grand list. Okay. And the new grand list. Um, the, like for example, people voted one cent for the fire uh, capital and the highway capital and half a cent for the uh, bridge and infrastructure. Well, half a cent on our old grand list is considerably less than half a cent on our new grand list. Okay, that's so true. that increases that bottom line and there's nothing we can do about it because it's already been voted for by the residents to do this. So it's going to be even harder for us to come up with, uh, you know, a lower bottom line when those things are increasing and that's not anything we can do. Okay, I want to go back and just um, <clears throat> clarify something Tina said because we finished the fiscal year ended June thirtieth. So <clears throat> Tina has a lot more accurate numbers about if we have a surplus in a certain area and she can give those those figures now. Whereas before in March and even up until June thirtieth we didn't have access to those figures. So that's something we can we can pre present and give to the public. I don't know if we have all those yet. Right. We, we won't have fund balance figures at, at least for over a month. Okay. Um, because there are still bills coming in from last fiscal year that, I'll, that will have to be paid in this fiscal year, but they revert back to last fiscal year as a cruel method does. So it, it's hard to know right now what you know i don't know if there's some big bills coming in or not so we'll have to you know if if i look at just uh the very preliminary stuff it looks like that we're in good shape in terms of we we have an estimated around um eighteen thousand dollars of expenses if we add all our expenses together to the good we did not spend that um, but then again, we have a bunch of bills coming in, so that probably will go away. But we also 
our revenue is also increased more than what we anticipated that it would be. So that's helpful too to offset those bills that are coming in, but we won't know anything. Okay. You know, the auditors are coming, you know, the end of the the end of August. So she'll have more final figures, but I can get it pretty close to what it's supposed to be. She just comes and looks at it. But okay. so I know we had some suggestions before um, from the public and yeah. I don't know if you want to talk about that. Um, sure. The um, you know, again, Travis and I were working fairly closely for, well, for a long time. Um, after the budget <coughs> fell, um, he and I certainly made a tremendous effort to reach out um, and really ask as many people and as diverse a population as we possibly could, um, you know, that we hadn't already, already talked to them, that what would it take for them to pass a budget? Um, unbiased, flat out answers. Um, we then um, compiled ideas and then started um, kind of running numbers, and these aren't exactly accurate numbers. And I, I want to just preface it by one of the concerns I've always had and why I ran was that I feel like um, this, t this town has run very reactionary, um, that decisions are made in the moment, <clears throat> we've got to do things. Uh, one of the things that came out um, was that really trying to get everything to go into the budgetary cycle, um, and that means basically any kind of new hires, new positions, any kind of major expenditures, with the exception of, you know, catastrophes or things. But that way then the public has the ability to vote on those things. Um, what that would entail currently would, and what was, uh, again, and I am, these are not necessarily my opinions, just keep in mind that there was, um, um, that there was interest, and now keep in mind that everything, um, that once the budget passes, the next one comes in March, so um, it's not too long. But basically um, what I was, what came out of all of this was, um, that they thought a new hiring freeze of new hires or in, internal restructures. Um, and part of that comes in the fact that we started discussing this was um, hiring, and towns do this, Richmond just did this, Essex in the middle, is literally hiring a company who comes in and they do nothing but um, do comparative studies. They look at every single employee, uh, their skills, their levels, and then compare it to what the rates are. And then they come in with a very comprehensive um, data-driven report that says, you're up, you're low, you're here. And that that would give us some direction on where we're falling. Because currently it's, you know, there's, we've been trying to adjust, but it's, the, it's not equitable in, in lots of ways. So we just need, uh, by putting a hiring freeze in, it would give us time to get our ducks in order and really set into a proactive uh, program going forward. So it's not this, you know, I'm not making enough money or, you know, and, and I have to say, having been in corporate America and lots of things, you know, I have concerns and I'm working for a company that got into budget problems and they went in and laid off all their uh, big salaries. We do not want to get into that position uh, where we have to lay people off. And so, we really, really are um, trying to do the best we can to hold on to everybody that we have. And I just want to reiterate, we are not talking about, um, and we're using the term salaries, which is actually a misnomer because we've never talked about reducing salaries. Legally, we wouldn't begin to do that. But we have talked about the raise structure. Um, and that what's come out is, uh, and this would also give us time to reevaluate the longevity plan because we're in unprecedented times where who would have thought we'd be in an 8.9 um, CPI. So that we now are in, in looking at that we need to get a longevity plan, first of all, that um, our, our staff and town people have an idea of how much raise they're going to get each year. So they don't get zero one year and 10% the next year. It also gives the town a better uh, way to 
uh, project a budget, that you have consistency when you have a range. So it's a win, you know, it, it's a balance, so it would win it out. Again, we need time to do that. We've got some contracts rolling over, so we can't do that. Um, it was definitely decided that there's no point uh, we can't. We do not want to touch non-union because it it would appear to be punitive because we cannot touch the others and we don't want to do that. So the conversation that I was told was that that that's going to have to wait. Um, but by doing a hiring freeze and no uh, restructuring that would in, incur a, a, a price increase, that it would give us the time to really set this town. Um, in a positive way to go forward. Um, and then the, the other, um, you know, there's just a couple of positions that are even up. Um, the other, which is heartbreaking to me, uh, and I'm just gonna read this, would be, because um, Travis did a wonderful job of taking ideas and consolidating it down into uh, digestible numbers and dialogue, and this is what he said. The Morristown Centennial Library, um, the Morristown Library received funding in the amount of $1,186,019 in FYI 23. The request this year has increased by an amount of uh, 113 and 350, or 60.94% uh, to 299,369. Um, this can be seen in the library budget request the select board and other members of the public at the public uh, budget meetings showed support for this increase at the last proposal. With that said, these are unique and challenging times, and this is a one item that should be considered. Should the library be level funded, this would save $113,000 and 350. Again, this is a one time you know, emergency. I'm gonna hold off on our questions because it's a big picture here. Um, the, um, and again, please remember this is, nothing's in stone, this is a starting point for a conversation, okay? And again, this is, so don't, don't anybody get defensive, let's just, we're starting conversations here. Um, the, um, so those really are um, the kind of big, big ticket items that are sitting out there. With that being said, um, the, um, let's see, let me just make sure, um, yeah, the, um, you know, and um, with the, the position holds uh, between the library and then the two current positions that are being proposed, um, it would net a savings of uh, $270,716,000. So this was, you know, going for the low hanging fruit, the big items, um, and um, that, the uh, let's just see. Um, so that uh, that's again, I just want to. That's a, a place to start a conversation. And again, I encourage everybody. Please, uh, it's everything's emotional, and uh, you know, there's there's two items in here that I was pitched for. So believe this is as hard for me. Um, but again, it's a conversation starter. So please, if as we go forward, um, understand that the residents of this town have said no twice and that this was you know for many many people and again it's not everybody but this was conducive and it was it was generated um, as a place to start okay so Laura you mentioned the library and the two positions are the um, police and rec, because those the, it would be maintaining the recreation coordinator as a part time, um, un, you know, unfortunately until March when we could um, get it into the budget. But at that point, we would also then hopefully have a uh, uh, a comprehensive view that we that going forward we would have solid information that it would be sustainable and would be uh, uh, competitive to the rest of the. Uh, uh, the country and the the one uh, police officer, unfortunately, which um, and the net value of that is the wreck would be forty one thousand six hundred thirty four, and the police officer would be ninety five two hundred eighty one. And again, this is not eliminating them. This is simply putting them on hold 
until we can regroup um, and then get it into the budget so that um, it becomes part of the big budgetary um, decision factor and it will give stability so that we're not in a position where all of a sudden we can't afford it or uh, that's the idea. So, so just that's to be, so just to be clear then so the suggestion is the Centennial Library that we would level fund them so we'd cut $113,000 there yeah. out of the previous budget that the rec coordinator position would stay half time not go to full time yep. say 41 there and the police officer that we're talking about is the police officer that w was added into the budget yes the police department requested so that we and I two pitched full -time. for it so I love that two full time yes. officers on at night yes and that no. is approximately 90, yeah, 95 thousand. Nice. For a total of 270. And I would love if somebody else would come up and say there's another way to save 270, and that's the idea is to get a conversation going. So um, but we, you know. I, and I will we're, say. We're really welcoming public yeah. input tonight. I just want Tina to get a penny on the grand list right now is 116,000. It was, but then they just did a brand new grand list, and it's more like 111,000. So it went down a little bit, okay. So that means the, okay. <clears throat> So those three articles that we voted for are not quite as They're not purple. quite as much as they were would have been, but again. And if we, and our, the budget that we, I just have a couple of questions, but the, the budget that we turned down was 12.6. Yes. And now we're, because of these increases, mostly because of the grand list and some other costs that have gone up since we voted on that budget, we're up to about, if we, just did that budget again, the exact same budget roughly. Well, I haven't done it with the $111,000 figure. Okay. I did it with a $116,000 figure, and it was, you know, more, obviously. Right. Okay. It came to 14.2. Yeah, 14 it was more. 2. So it's below 14.2. Mm -hmm. Right. So let me read one more paragraph and that, uh, oh. And then to get from 14.2 down to less than 10%, at the time I did the calculation, and of course, like I said, things have changed, you'd have to cut $350,000. Okay. That's you. the information. That's all I got. Yeah. The, uh, and that's uh, the last paragraph I was going to read was basically Travis uh, doing some rough estimates with the, um, um, with the uh, grand list that it would get it down to around nine. Um, <clears throat> so that's, again, it's a starting point. Open the floodgates. Well, the only thing that, yeah. you know, as we, as we, um, one of the things I think that's important in this budget discussion is um, instead of talking about percentages, um, that we put real dollars and cents to what's being proposed in terms of cuts. Yep. So that when we talk about the Morristown Centennial Library being level funded, uh, um, uh, cutting $113,000 out of it. What does that really relate to in terms of an average home in Morristown in terms of dollars saved on your tax bill? And I think as we walk down and talk about these or any other positions or uh, ideas, um, that we do the same with the recreation coordinator, the police officer, how does that really translate down into actual dollars and cents? And I'll give you, for instance, just for conversation's sake, and then I'll be quiet for a minute. Um, I asked uh, our finance department to run a level fund based on everything else being the same. We take $113,350 out of the um, budget, level fund the library on a half a million dollar house appraised, the new appraisal, um, what you'd be saving is $48 on your tax bill, municipal tax bill. So I think as we walk down the path of, of cutting here and cutting there and trying to drill down to a number, I think it's also fair for people to realize that at the end of the day, if you take the library out, uh, level funding from last year, on a half a million dollar house, you're going to save $48. On a $400,000 house, you're going to save $38.40. So I think that it would be helpful to keep a running tally of really what this is going to translate to in actual dollars um, to the taxpayer. So 
So I just leave that off of that. So I'm Bob and have Stephanie come up. Can you tell us? More? Steph Hoffman, Mud City Loop. I'm the treasurer, volunteer treasurer of the Morristown Centennial Library. I hope this baby isn't born in this room tonight. Um, <laughs> But do you have hers? That's <laughs> um, uh, so I want to start with, I know we're in a difficult time. I came here a little over a month ago and I put a presentation together and I thought we had some really great consensus around the fact that the library is dollars and cents wise an immeasurable resource to the community. I got some numbers today to tell you a little bit more about that. But I don't think it's really up for debate. If you want to ask whether it's worth $48 to the mom that relies on it as after school care every day, let's ask her. But I'll tell you something, $113,000 is a third of our budget. We employ six people. I came here a month and a half ago and told you what those folks are paid. We don't just face the fact that if we overpay them, which isn't even in a world of possibility at what they're being paid currently, that they might have to be fired because we can't sustain it. We're on the other end of this problem. We have folks that carry one or two advanced degrees that are being paid $16 and $17 an hour without benefits because they're not municipal employees. What a lot of people don't understand is the library is a public library. It is not a town department. We are a town unit, and if you want to get into the weeds, I'll be happy to come back for three hours and explain it. But the truth of the matter is we're a nonprofit. 501c3, we're run by a board, and we have an endowment. That endowment gives everyone in the entire town approximately a $35 discount every year on their library costs. If you go to Waterbury, if you go to Hyde Park, if you go to other neighboring towns with similarly sized libraries, they're paying $70 to $100 a year for their library. You pay $50, okay? The reason for that is we run a lean budget, we have for decades, and we discount it with the endowment. Other towns don't use their endowment at the level that we do to help subsidize the library's costs. Another thing that we're able to do is we're able to save money because our employees are not town employees. If the library continues to face these budget cuts, we'll be forced to move the library municipal. You add the benefits packages, we're having the same conversation about everyone that works at the library that we're having about our great town employees. I did a back of the envelope last year to explain this. It's about, at current rates just for health insurance, it's over $70,000 for the employees that qualify at the library that we're saving each year because our employees get their insurance on the exchange. Those are the types of savings that we're able to embed in our budget year after year. I've been in this position for four years. I've been in budget talks for four years. If I gave a presentation formally tonight, it'd be my sixth PowerPoint in less than a year and a half. And while we all love PowerPoints, I wanted to talk to you as a human. This is not a viable way to run our library. We will either close a third of the time, minimum, or have to lay people off or have everyone quit. People who've been working there for 30 plus years. That is not a scenario that we want to take back to our staff. It's not a scenario I can take back to the director in any kind of serious way. We are ranked first on the 2022 statistics in the state, not at our size, in number of programs offered by orders of magnitude. Those programs have let lo local area schools send droves of children there after school to be entertained for hours for working parents that can't make it right now because of the situation that we're all in economically. And I stood here a month and a half ago and explained to you, yes, we have payroll increases, but we've been steadily increasing our payroll at the same rate year after year for a decade. We haven't changed that increase. So penalizing our employees is what you'd be doing by making this cut. Otherwise, like everyone else in this room, we face electricity increased costs, telephone increased costs, water increases, and propane. We actually level fund our programs and materials year after year for at least 15 years now because we subsidize those areas with grants. And us volunteers work our butts off to raise as much money as we possibly can to subsidize elsewhere, elsewise in the budget. So I'm pleading with the town, and I would love to have known if we had a vote on the last budget, how many of those same folks would have voted to sustain our entire request. I don't think it would still be two to one to vote it down. So while we are absolutely welcome to come to the table 
and have a discussion about how we can pinch pennies, because we all know it's necessary. Taking down our budget to level funding is absolutely inappropriate, unacceptable, and everyone will feel it. And I'll also say that, just as an example of the history here, we came last year in the budget discussions, and we were level funded last year as well. We weren't level funded because we had some surplus of cash that we could come up with to fund our budget, but because we recognized that there were other areas that needed attention. And we were promised in, that, in those discussions that we wouldn't be coming back this year and having the same attack on our funding that we went through last year. Our endowment can't sustain taking from it in perpetuity over the amount that our financial investors at Morgan Stanley recommend to us. We had to put a policy in place to protect that endowment to continue this discount for all Morristown residents forever. I know I've taken more than two minutes, but I think the library is well worth it. And I hope we won't look at this as, let's pick apart the sections of our budget where folks need support in our community and need this resource and rely on it to survive in this economy. I hope we look away from those areas and recognize how important they are. Thank you. Uh, Mary Lou on Zoom. Yeah, hi. Could you hear me? Yes. Could you write, tell us who you are? Hi, uh, Mary Lou Nichols. I just want to say that hiring a consulting firm to come in and evaluate the, the budget, the payroll, the qualifications of each staff person, I would think is going to run at least 250000 plus in itself. So when we're talking about spending money, where is that money going to come from to hire a firm to do a quality control audit on the, in the, the and how is that going to be affect the morale of the employees to be evaluated by an outside firm? I just find that very concernable. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm yes, sorry. Uh, Bob Bortry. Uh, I spoke at the last select board meeting about the difficult time that we're in. We're all, we've all seen it, grocery store, gas pump set, whatever you buy. And the town is no different. I think if we look at this as a one-off and try and pass a budget that reflects the real cost that this town has, and maybe the town the select board, the administration could consider caps on future budgets, 4%, 3%, whatever it might be. That might be palatable to the, the way we're going, it's unsustainable. I mean, people that don't have the income but have property are going to be hurt badly by this if this keeps con this continuation of you know budgets that are six eight ten twelve percent we're all we're all good we're all eventually going to have to leave uh, you know it, you know some of us are good for now or good for a couple of years but i think we have to come together as a community and get this budget passed in a form that doesn't degrade what the town is providing to the community. And, you know, there was something about, you know, cutting here, cutting there. If we are not willing to fund the library, if we're not willing to spend $125,000 to hire a town manager, uh, where are we going? Where are we going? We have some incredibly important things on the horizon, and we need to stop the fighting, the finger pointing, and come together and say, yeah, I don't like this, but for this year, yes, we can do it. Let's see if we can implement things that address that so we're not back in the same place next year. Mm -hmm. I think if the board can come out with those ideas and sort of not guarantee but a willingness to address the community and say this is what we're going to try and do to mitigate these 
budget increases year after year because it, it's not just a budget increase municipally, it's a budget increase for your educational tax as well, which runs an enormous amount of money, $19,300 per student recently. Um, so this is not sustainable for any of us. Um, so what I would like to see is all of us here, all of us in the community support what we have here and let's make it work. This year we have to get through it. We have to. We have no choice. We have to get through it. I don't like it probably. Nobody in this room likes it. Nobody out in the community likes it. But I don't like it when I go to the grocery store and spend $100 and walk out with two bags of groceries. I don't like that either. And the town is in the same situation. So let's support this and get it reasonably to where we can get it and let's stop the fighting and move on. We've got bigger fish to fry. Thank you, Bob. Bob, I wanted to just follow up, sorry. Just to follow up um, a little bit of history and, uh, and I wasn't on the board when all of this was going on but, and it's not an excuse, but the budget was kept artificially low for at least 10 years and it's coming around right now to bite us. We've had two years in a row that it's been high. Um, and I, I agree that the uh, planning should have been a little bit better and different than it was, and I think going forward it will. But um, we, we don't want to go backwards. We want to keep moving forward, and, and uh, that's what, what I'm concerned about is, is moving backward. Do you think it's reasonable? that you could consider a cap of 4%. I know it in some- You mean going it, forward? Going forward. I, I, don't, I don't know, I'm, I'm not an expert many, because- Many, many, many municipalities do that. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think I'd, I'd have to have more information before I said yes to that. It certainly would be worth exploring. I think it would give everyone a sense of, okay, you know, we're trying, you know, we're, we're, we're actively considering what is going on in the future because this is not sustainable. It's simply not. And, and I, you know, we've got to find a way out of this. I, I, I can't agree with you, Bob. And the, the only thing I would say at this point, what the board has talked about is looking at this cap on the longevity policy. But looking at the cap on the entire budget we really haven't had that conversation yet but maybe it's something we need to consider at this uh, you know are we ready at this point to to buy into something like that i don't think we are but it's a concept that's worthy of our attention certainly and there was there was one other thing i wanted to mention i've heard it over and over again that residents feel like we're subsidizing a lot of the development that's going on in town I know for a fact that many, many towns, cities, so on and so forth, uh, require impact fees from developers. And this has not happened in our community, and there's a lot of angst about that. So this might be another thing that we need to consider. Uh, I don't know the facts behind that, but I've heard it over and over again, something that you might want to consider well, going and forward. You know, this is part of what we're saying is that uh, impact fees, you know, the 1% uh, tax, none of that can happen in this budget cycle. But as soon as we get this passed, we can start it. It requires some charter governance. There's steps which we're already talking about. And that ultimately is the problem is that, you know, uh, none of this happens overnight. And again, we are living in unprecedented times in the past two years. Um, and that it's, it's hard on everybody, you know. And that's, as I keep saying, this, you know, there were some decisions made uh, coming out of post-pandemic. I'm actually talking uh, with some folks now. You know, there's a brewery in Burlington who is literally pouring out beer because he can't sell it. The national... Uh, uh, national sales data shows that all the breweries are down um, and that uh, restaurants and that the um, we came out of the pandemic and um, you know we were hit with inflation we were hit with um, um, you know the supply chain and 
were now, you know, they all, so many businesses were in debt. And so, you know, we're starting to see this rolling effect. So it's, it's a much bigger picture. And I, you know, I don't mean to be the pessimist, but, and that's why I keep saying if we can all just join together and understand that this is a temporary situation, I, you know, and we can um, get a proactive budget to get, you know, a proactive plan going forward so that we're not going through this. Um, and I do, um, you know, I'm, and that has been a huge concern. People have said that, you know, we haven't taken um, into account that, you know, it's this much this year. Then when you add the um, interest and everything, it, and it gets to where it's, it's unsustainable. And we don't want to get to that position. And that's where, you know, and we don't want people to leave, you know. So it's, uh, uh, it's, there are no easy, good decisions here. There are not. I'd like to call on Tommy. Please uh, identify yourself on Zoom. My name is Nancy Donovan, okay. and I am wanting the whole board to listen to the people. You have gotten voted down twice now. No. So this time you really need to make concessions and listen to the people instead of forcing your will on some in things that need to be changed. We all need to come together, but the first of it is you have to start listening. I, I feel like it's been poo-pooed off and that you're just going to do your own agenda anyway. That needs to stop. And the second thing is we are expected to be um, nice to people and interact, but it starts with you, Judy. When you call people evil and mercenaries, Point of order. That's out of line. Yeah, I don't care. No, it's, it's not. the truth. Can you mute? Yeah. Let's move on. Thank you. Okay. Um, go ahead. I'm Jerry Throne. <clears throat> I'm in. I uh, live in Morrisville. So, let's see what we can do to get this budget passed, and then move on. And I've looked at several things and crunch a bunch of numbers. And one of the things I haven't heard anything about here is how the homestead tax credit uh, helps uh, people who have low or no income keep their homes. So what I did was I did a little test and I used the, uh, the state website, which they have a, a spreadsheet. You can plug the numbers in and it cranks out how much uh, the state's gonna chip in and how much tax you'll have to pay after that. So I just use my house, and uh, of course the educational tax does not enter into it, and our budget does not uh, address anything about the educational tax. Our budget addresses the municipal tax, so that's that's what affects uh, the, uh, this particular spreadsheet that I ran. And so for someone making twenty-five thousand dollars a year, or someone making forty-five thousand dollars a year they both wind up not paying any additional tax if there's a 10% tax increase over last year. The homestead. This is just, uh, I think, just educational, right? Yeah. I think homestead. Only municipal, <laughs> because municipal. educational, although it's a big part of our taxes, it's not part of this budget. And I'm sorry, so, that was based on the home value of um, how much? Based on my home value and my taxes, if I made $25,000 or if I made 45000 because I think the cutoff is like forty eight or 49000 If you make more than that, you get very little or nothing. Do you, do you mind us stating what the home value is? That's fine. I don't care. Yeah, oh, it's, it's public, it's public yeah. information. 169700 that's, so what's, just, that's what's on my tax bill. Yeah, well, on your tax bill, exactly. That's I just want to give some bill. people references because, they're, you know, right. a lot of people saw it double, and it, there has been concern that they're going to lose some of their homestead <coughs> rebate because their houses are appraised more. So I just wanted to get some numbers in there. Right. <coughs> yeah. So then I started looking at um, what the components are of our budget, of the last several iterations of the budget, and looking for the big ticket items the things that we can really make a difference 
if we look at them. And one of the things that I, I've heard from, from people uh, outside, in this meeting and outside this meeting, is that they feel that the general government uh, is too large. Well, the general government is 25% of the total budget. So yes, it is large. Police department is 22% of the total budget. We're not talking about any cuts to that. Highway department is 39% of the total budget. And I haven't looked at the other uh, EMS or fire department because they're, they're just not large enough to, and, and I think the sentiment that I've heard here is that we didn't want to touch those uh, budgets, I, portions of the budget either. So then what I do is I looked at general government salaries, just the salaries, because that's what I've heard complaints about that general government salaries, they shouldn't be getting as much as they're getting. Well, I looked at that. And what I find out is that compare 22-23 to 23-24, it's only 7.44% difference. Now, if you make an adjustment for, because our, our budget uh, contemplates uh, a, uh, a new uh, HR hire, and it also contemplates taking the Parks and Recs director from part-time to full-time, even though no, earlier all up on the, that, all that up was something grabs. that was yeah. discussed about maybe making changes. But up until that point in time, this is the information I had. Mm -hmm. So uh, by the time you make that adjustment, it's 7.44%. So I don't think that's terribly large increase for uh, general government. Thank you. Okay. Um, since I mentioned the highway department, I have also heard from townspeople that they feel that we have too many people in the highway department. So I went to look at that to see whether there was any information that would uh, tell me one way or the other, whether that was true or not. And so I looked at just the salaries, the wages, the, the, the thing that people see in their checks, not all the other things that pay for insurance and taxes, Social Security, and all those other add-ons. And I, I looked at that, and the difference is only 3% between last year's highway department uh, wages and this year's projected budget uh, wages. Uh, that didn't include, uh, oh wait, no, I'm sorry, it did. It did include overtime. Uh, last year's overtime was 29%. This year's uh, is projected to be 25%. So then I, I thought about it and I said, well, you know, maybe we need more people because we have more roads to maintain. And so then I looked at what we have. So we have 104 <laughs> 0.58 total highway miles, class one, two, and three. We have what I figure is 13 employees. If I'm incorrect, someone will correct me, I'm sure. <laughs> but when you look at that and you take the total cost of uh, salaries in 24, which are projected to be 967, 967,000, and divide that by the total highway miles, you get $9,254 per mile is what we're spending. Compare that to some of the towns that I could get information from. Uh, Hyde Park spends $5,500 per mile. So that's a little bit less than half. And Elmore spends $4,800 per highway mile. Then I looked at employees per, uh, or I'm sorry, miles per employee. So here in Morristown, Morrisville, uh, we have our employees uh, take care of, each one takes care of eight miles. We're in Hyde Park, they take care of almost 14 miles. In Stowe, they take care of 14 miles, based upon six employees, which someone told me that's what, that's what they had in Stowe. 
but I haven't verified that. <clears throat> and in Elmore, uh, Elmore takes care of 12 and a half uh, miles per employee. So it's just an indication. It may be an area where we might decide we could save some money. That's not to say that Kevin, if he's here, it's not to say that Kevin doesn't need as much help as he has, but it's just something to think about. I think we did do a, a freeze in highway right now. It was a position that we, uh, yeah, that we did. But. Okay, the last thing I have <coughs> that I'll give you is um, I went through the budget line item by line item <coughs> and put together a spreadsheet and I referenced the account number, which is the account number in the budget, and a short description, and then a column that says question, comment. And the ones that stand out uh, to me are the huge increases from one year to the next. And I'm sure there's reasons for it, but it just stands out to me. Like, for instance, uh, under general government, uh, the web page went up 64%, the cost of the web page. Um, interactive software, minutes, that went up almost 1,200%. Payroll processing contract, almost 600%. Network systems and equipment, that increased 600%. And a footnote about that is that if we're going to spend an, uh, an increase of $15,000 this year over last year, why wouldn't we spread that out? Because it's for computer equipment. Why wouldn't we spread that out over a, a couple of years, at least three years? That's the minimum that a computer usually, you know, the life of a computer. Uh, operating supplies for the Tegu building, the new sign. Okay, it's a minor thing, but you know what? I picked up on it. So there's a $2,000 increase for the sign, but this is not an expenditure that we're going to go through every year. This is this year and maybe 10 or 20 years down the road. Uh, mowing, seven, seven cemeteries. That increased uh, $7,000 and amounts to 58% increase. But it happens to be the same company that mows the Oxbow, where there was no increase. So it, it's an inconsistency in my mind. Why, if we're using the same company, did they increase the cemeteries but not Oxbow? And by the way, maybe we need to get more prices if that's the, you know, if, if, if there's no real good reason for it. Maybe we need to uh, get bids on it. Uh, repairs and maintenance services, that went up 44%. Uh, heating oil, I know, went up, and that's something that's out of our control because it's the price of heating uh, oil and also the, uh, the quantity of heating oil from one year to the next increased. Probably last year was a very uh, mild winter. So that, that's probably why it, it went up. Um, there's a county tax, which is, went up 13%. We have no uh, control over that. Uh, Centennial Library, we talked about earlier. Uh, Pleasant View Cemetery, um, bookkeeping services went up 25%. <coughs> why would bookkeeping services increase 25%? <coughs> uh, bridge replacement, the interest and I guess the uh, payment of the loan. Uh, so in the budget we have $58,000 and my question is, and I don't know whether maybe should, we should ask this before, but aren't grants available from the state, county, or the feds for that bridge? I can't answer your I know, question. I know, it's, these are, <laughs> oh, these I, are. I know that the person who could answer your question is not here. Okay, so, so these are somewhat rhetorical questions or things <clears throat> we might want to look into. And I think the, I think the bridge um, budget line item you're talking about is something that, that is in the budget as a, uh, not a placeholder, but it's it, it's for us to, to build equity there so we can do the construction. Of Judy, yeah. what that is in the general okay. government budget is our uh, payment to the bank for the Bridge Street Bridge. It has nothing to do with repairing a bridge. We have a different fund for that, and we did get uh, some funds to help with the Walton Road Bridge through a grant. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I, I thought it said Walton Road underneath that. Oh, no, it shouldn't have if it we did. Have? No, it, it's just debt service. It's what we have to pay to the bank for the Bridge Street Bridge payment. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, okay, so the, the total of all those increases amounts to $278,000. One year to the next. Looking at the highway department, I have a question on attachment D. I don't think you can answer it right now, but maybe it's something you look into. Why are the fourth and the last Tech 2 people in the list being paid less th uh, in this year's budget than last year? Or their hourly rate has decreased. Well, it depends on what step they're on on the tech scale. Yeah. There's multiple steps, and it depends on when they were hired and how much experience they have as to what step they start on. Okay, so so the tech that was there last year may have left, and another tech was hired that wasn't as experienced, wouldn't be paid as much. Okay, well, that's that's a good explanation. It was just something that struck me as being odd. We never see things go down. <laughs> Okay. Uh, office supplies for the highway department increased $2,000, but it was an 80% increase. Now, $2,000 is not a big thing, but uh, this happened to be computers. So the same comment as I had before, um, you know, even if it's a $2,000 uh, increase over the year before, why wouldn't we spread it out over at least three years? So can I ask, I ask you a question? Are you using the uh, data from the book in your hand? No. Okay. No, I'm using what's online okay. uh, on the town website okay. as the, the latest budget. Okay, good. Thank well, you. I only, I'm only carrying this because I had done the calculations uh, previously as to what percentage each department uh, was of the total budget. That's the only reason. <laughs> All right, so, uh, yeah, the same comment about, uh, you know, if it's computers, why not spread it over some time, time periods? Uh, here's some, something curious. Uh, plow blades and shoes, I know we need them, uh, increased 10,500, which is a 70% increase. So, Any reason? Uh, no, I directed uh, up here. Yeah. I, I'm, gonna oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm going to say that, and someone can correct me, it's because of inflation. I don't know. Do you know, Tina? Um, Kevin, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think part of the reason is inflation, but part of the reason is we're diff using a different plow blade that will last longer so that we won't be replacing them as often, and in the end, we will save money. Is that right, Kevin? Correct. So then I wonder if this is uh, something that could be considered more of a capital expenditure and could be spread out over a period of time, or if it's something that wears out in the course of a year, then there's nothing we can do about it. You, you can't capitalize the things like those. Those are disposable type things, and you can't capitalize those. Okay. But it is something that could possibly, if it lasts longer past one season of snow plowing, it's something that could reduce the budget Trust next year. No. That ain't happening. That ain't happening. That ain't happening. Okay. You guys look like you know what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Fine. <laughs> I don't snow plow, so I don't know. Uh, welding supplies, small amount, went up $2,000, about a 100% increase. Uh, repair and maintenance services uh, increased 55000 which is a 65% increase. Here's something interesting, capital equipment, there were various items that were listed. Uh, it was an increase of $38,700, um, and that's something I would think could be spread over several years. Um, That's buying various pieces of machinery that is supposed to cut down our manpower and cut down the use of all of our trucks. But, but isn't that something that could be spread over time? Well, I mean, I, if you want to take a loan out for it, is that what you're trying to say? I don't... Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just looking at, at these things and trying to put them all on one year just doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. So, can, I, uh, can I add something no, to this? No, I, I no, Carly, someone's, so if it, if Kathy, it, someone's already on the, at the mic, please. So if it means that it makes sense to hold off on that, on that expenditure for fiscal uh, uh, 24, and we put forth that expenditure in fiscal 25, maybe that's a good thing to do. It, that's definitely a possibility we can look into. Okay. Good. That's, that's why I bring these things up. Yep, yep. Yeah. All right. Uh, replaced two dump trucks. That increased 50000 uh, Sidewalk machine, that was an increase of 35000 
Um, same comment, if we don't need to replace, the, you know, if, if they're not falling apart and costing us a million dollars to maintain them, is it something that we could put off until next year? So, can I, can I speak to that? Sure. Um, the the $25,000 I think you're referring to is, is the first payment on yeah. those trucks. Um, they were deferred already to purchase those trucks, yeah. and typically you'd either go out five years or seven years, depending on the warranty that you can get on them. Um, the tandem was scheduled to get replaced in fiscal year 21-22, and the cost of that was, uh, the bid price on that was 198000 Correct me if I'm wrong, Kevin. Um, that was passed over uh, and put on to fiscal year 23-24. I think part of that was supply chain. Um, the increase in cost of that tandem from 21-22 to 23-24 was $75,000 alone. Um, same thing uh, for the single axle. Um, that was scheduled to be in 22-23. Um, that was transferred to this year, I think, for supply chain you know, reasons. Um, that truck increased $93,000 because of supply chain and availability. And that's what they can, that's what they can get. And the $25,000 each that you're seeing, I think, in your budget was going to be the first year's payment on mm -hmm. those trucks. Okay. Um, but um, that's coming off from this 23-24 this, this, um, budget because even if we ordered them, um, say, in September, um, of, of this year, we wouldn't get this fiscal year. So you say it's coming off. Uh, it's, it's coming off of this year's budget, or it's the two payments are going to be coming off this budget. Okay, so that'll reduce the budget. Fifty thousand. Yeah, that was that's the yeah. plan. It, okay, so I've got, yeah. It on, yeah, I've got a few things in there for highway that, that there's, <coughs> there's fifty thousand dollars that would come out of the budget. Okay, that helps. Um, all right, gravel, um, $25,000 increase. Is this something that can come out of our pit? Well, when we, we now have access to the pit. I think now we do. We haven't had access to the pit. We were waiting for the state to give us our Act 250 pit permit, and we have it. So I think we're, if I remember talking to Eric, we do, we do have access to it, right? No, not yet. Okay, we have to, we're waiting for the July permit. 11th. July 11th. So it's been none of the fault of anybody in this community. It has been at the state level that yep. has, has cost the taxpayers hundreds of thousands of dollars, and we have had to buy gravel and sand because of that. Right, but this is imminent now that we're going to be able to have access well, to it. not till July 11th. July 11th, so there's a That's a week away. Case. Right, yeah. Yeah. It's next but we week. still, yeah. Hopefully by the end of July we'll have our permit. Yes. Okay. And hopefully early in August, we're going to get Percy in there, and we're going to be creating and making our own gravel. As quick as we can. So, so this, this line item might be reduced. Yeah. I think it, it had, uh, I think originally it was reduced, and then Eric had to put more, or suggested more money to put in because we didn't know where the permitting process was. So okay. that's a possibility. Yeah. Just for example, we didn't use as much sand <coughs> last year as uh, predicted, and so that's been a surplus in the budget we'll be using for something else. Yeah, sand's further down. Uh, sand increased $40,000 over last year. I uh, had the same comment when I went through this, can it come from our pit, but you, you said there's a surplus. So that $40,000 increase sounds like it can be reduced as well in the next version of the budget. You mean the 2024 budget? 23-24 budget, the, the, no, the budget no. that we're going to vote on. Possibly, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Right. Well, you'll you'll look Kevin, into it. I'm sure. Kevin's saying, yeah. <coughs> we don't know. No, we don't know. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll be real quick. I'll finish this up. Uh, hot mix patching that increased ten thousand uh, was a three hundred percent increase. No explanation. Just bringing bringing it out. Line painting. Now here's something. Line painting increased $20,000, which is a 500% increase. We only spent $8,500 last year. And as far as I'm concerned, when I see the quality of the line work, it was horrible. So I don't think we got our money's worth. I don't the think price of 
the price of painting roads has gone up astronomically. Okay. Yeah. To the point that we're just not painting some roads. Because it is, it's gone from, oh, I forget what, um, it, it's gone up many fold in a very short period of time. Yeah. And I might add, and Kevin, um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, there was an issue with the previous contractor and the quality of the paint and longevity of the paint. So I think that there's been a rebidding of that, is that correct? And right. the new contractor was selected and hence that is the reason why there was a slight increase in the cost of that. Okay, and there's no recourse with the other contractor? No. Okay. That paint's long gone. Yep, okay. Uh, yes, capital infrastructure increased $50,000. Is that something we can uh, look what at? What'd you say? Uh, capital infrastructure improvements. That's replacing the Coal Hill culvert, and I don't know that it can wait. I mean, some of these things we can't just keep kicking down the road, even though they're expensive. Okay, well, just asking a question. No, I, I don't know, because I, I don't know culverts, but that's what I've been told. Is it a metal culvert? Anybody know? Since Fine. I can't ask yeah. Kevin. Is it a metal culvert? It doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it does matter. Yeah. I believe, Kevin, is that a cement culvert? Cement culvert. They can generally be repaired and give you a lot more life. So you don't have to spend 50, you know, that much money. I probably, I'm, I'm assuming, and I'm pretty sure that we'd be consulting with an engineer. Yeah. This All right. isn't something All right, well, I've, I've done that work before. <clears throat> so I have my first hand experience. But, you know, okay. to save, to save uh, you know, a, a bundle of money, I would think uh, a phone call to an engineer might be worthwhile. Well, it's up Kevin, to you. Kevin, it's up to you. With the, with the culvert that we're talking about, um, has, is Tyler Munley or somebody involved in that? So there is an engineer oh, involved. Oh, yes, yes. the engineering and, and uh, locked natural resources for permits. Yeah. So there, the was, engineer, there was an engineer involved in that. Okay. Uh, storm drain repair and maintenance supplies, that increased 4,000, which is a 500% increase. Uh, do we really expect to have that much more uh, storm drain maintenance and repair this year over last year? Five, 500%. Can you say that one more time? Storm drain maintenance repair supplies. Do we expect that we're going to need 500% more? I think what you see in front of you is what was recommended to us by our department head and was gone over with by our financial director and our town administrator, as those were the needs that the town needed to stay where it is, maintain itself so that we can provide the services we need for the people in our community. Okay. Uh, those items total 300000 Judy, there's a lady over here who would like to speak. Yeah. Okay. I'm done. Okay, thank you. I just I want to make sure she's sitting on the floor. I can't be seen. So that's okay. Hi everyone, Allison Link um, and Hirschbane Silber, who's five. Who you may have heard snoring earlier. Now he's <laughs> watching. But when it's an important uh, time, then you show up. So um, I appreciate so many of the folks who are sh here, first of all, and for the select board and, and town staff, um, and for all the detail put in um, of really attention to every budget line. Uh, it's really impressive that people are caring. Um, I know there are also a lot of people who aren't in the space and who maybe don't know as much and aren't as educated on really the ins and outs and vote without um, you know really knowing a lot. Uh, you. Well, I also want to say I, I liked what I was hearing about prevention in the sense of, um, you know, investing in certain things so that it goes a long way. So that relates to some of my theme. And you may remember me with my Healthy Lamoille Valley hat, some of you. Uh, maybe that was last month. Um, where the Healthy Lamoille Valley is our local substance prevention coalition, a program at the Lamoille Family Center. Um, and we were here talking about the town plan and the Health and Wellness Committee, which um, Val Balcor and I followed up with Judy and sending um, a description and you know trying to move that forward with how we can support the town with that effort. 
obviously with that hat on, support all the protective factors in our community because the investment in those things like uh, recreation and library and all these things go a very, very long way and how important that is for our youth, but not only for our youth, but also for everyone in our community. Um, those protective factors just feed us all, um, you know, our, our, the vitality of our community and can help sustain that. Okay, now I'm gonna take that Healthy in the Wild Valley hat off um, and just talk personally. Um, we live right in the village here, our family. We've been here almost a decade. Um, when we came into town, there was um, very, <coughs> Well, when we came into town, there was very little um, recreation funding. Um, Tim Scandell was uh, maybe getting $5,000 a year from the town. Uh, Judy and I, Steph, uh, you know, some others. You can hear me? Oh, speak into them. Okay, well, I want you to hear me too. It's important I see some faces in here. Okay, thank you. I'll continue. Um, as you know at that, uh, or if you know the history here and you've been in town longer than I have, um, the, uh, the funding uh, at some point was eliminated from the budget. Tim was sick, I don't know, it, we kind of lost funding. And from that point, I was one of the people along with a, a group um, of previous recreation um, committee members and coming back to it and did a survey at the Oxbow all that summer and you know and can try to continue the process of building the recreation um, aspect of our town for all ages um, as being that huge protective factor and like really the need in a town our size comparable to Waterbury or other you know other towns that have recreation departments and we had no funding in that area though of course we have our community development um, coordinator who does great job and there's a lot that we offer through that but to um, to really have it focused on recreation which doesn't only mean physical recreation means all areas of you know recreation and wellness and I know Anna's been picking that up um, but to do a little bit more of the history when we came um, we started to get a little bit of funding every year um, as part of that committee 5,000 and 10,000 investing in a system my rec which was Sarah was advocating for at that time and you know how much that was going to be Tom uh, you know other folks who I see in the room also trying to be part of that um, community involvement, um, all volunteers. Uh, and then to uh, the next level of um, when Steph, with Steph's leadership, um, you know, getting to the point of, okay, we, we really need to put some money behind this and hiring someone who is not just volunteers. We were doing so much, as much as we could at that time. I'm sure Steph can get up as well. But, um, you know, and to move into the, and Judy, of course, um, but can move into the direction of, well, if we have, we need paid staff for this and we really want to take it to the next level. Um, we had put in for full time at that point, but that was leveled to not be full time. And so, you know, took it for what it was and saying, wow, how amazing our town has uh, more of um, more investment than be than before. Uh, and in many more investment than in many, many years. And at that point, um, for I guess a variety of reasons, the committee of volunteers was dissolved when Anna, well, when the, the process of hiring for somebody came about, and then Anna was hired uh, to jump right into the summer program, if I remember, with just, you know, I, I mean, which is huge. I used to be a camp director in many years. Like, it was a full-time job. I was full-time for, for a camp, um, and there were multiple staff full-time. I mean, it's a really big deal. And then to just start to figure out her, the, where things are in this community and to build relationships and to see who the relationships are going to be with in the community, to start to navigate that, see what she can do, along with having to plan for another summer where she actually has say in it when it wasn't planned for her and to move towards that which I know you know I visited and I have one child who's going to come at the end of the summer because he's away at a different camp now um, but um, but just to see all of the differences that have been made it's the most affordable camp in the region uh, that's that's sustainable that is well regarded and is gaining even more respect um, in the community for the layers of uh, of detail and of attention that Anne is giving to, uh, you know, different age groups and populations. I remember when our oldest, who's now 12, was five, walking into a room where it was a free for all. I mean, you know, Christy and everyone did a huge, huge job of this of the summer rec and what a huge asset to the community. But that little five-year-old. Now I have another five-year-old, but that you know, that many years ago, I was. 
I, I was questioning, you know, where the program is and going, and I think Anna's taking it to a next level, you know, comparable to, you know, places like other communities around that have um, municipal recreation pieces, and I know that um, regardless of who's in the position, just advocating for recreation in general in our town um, as to to not be cut or not be leveled, along with protective factors like the library and others that I've heard, because that's the investment for the future. And if it's um, about not liking what's happening in that realm of our town, then it's about also all of us, I'm going to speak to all of us, of saying, hey, for recreation, this is what we want and need for this age group, for this, and based on the inclusivity statement of our town, and inclusive to all populations for recreation, whatever that may mean a lot of different things um, you know and and also with the health and wellness committee and opportunities there for our town this leads to the vitality even the economic vitality just looking at um, you know people who are will stay will come be want to we all you know what do we say about our town to play to recreate to work to live all these things and I think to cut any of that um, even to level it for a few months um, it, it it just doesn't have that prevention area mindset. And I know even from, you know, with, with back to my Healthy the Moyle Valley hat, just even thinking about the opportunities um, for recreation and protective factors and being I'm on the People's Academy parent advisory group and, you know, active in a lot of different things. Everywhere I go, they talk about we need more recreation, we need more activities for kids in particular. You know, that's the kid focus piece. But there's also for every age, for all of us to engage in community and to have opportunities for recreation. When we were on the rec commission, um, you know, we put in benches along the rail trail. We, you know, we put in, you know, for people to be able to walk and not feel like they have to go the whole way. And it, it, that's about inclusivity and equity. We, we put in picnic benches, we put in some other, you know, equipment more like, you know, capital related things. but. You, that, there's that investment, but if you don't have a staff person to do it, we know, we, we're, we're volunteers. We can't all do it as volunteers, and I just want to, um, you know, if no one else is saying it in these budget conversations, we heard all about on um, pretty much every other budget line, uh, but I just wanted to um, put my, uh, my full self and full, um, advocacy for um, having paid staff here in Morristown for what the potential can be. It is just beginning. It, it, it's a we haven't had this in so long. And so it needs to move forward. And I know the budget, we want to move forward too. And we want and do things in a sustainable way and to do things that have an investment. Investing in recreation is an investment. And it also helps protect our youth from other risk factors that when they see other social costs in other areas that we're not considering if we don't have these types of programming. Um, so thank you for your time. And uh, and sorry that I'm probably going to leave with Hirsch at this point, okay. but thank you. Okay. Um, Sean, did you still want to speak? I think I do, and I'm going to make it very quick. Okay. <clears throat> My name is Chantel Bingeno, and I've been living here in Morseville since 1984, and I taught here at the Morristown Elementary School for 37 years. I'm a little dry, so uh, I need to drink some water after I leave. I want to begin by wholeheartedly thanking the members of our select board, past and present, who have and continue to dedicate many hours to our town. And although he's no longer with us, I also want to take a quick moment to thank Eric Dodge for his dedication and service and his efforts to produce a budget that try to sustain the services that we need and supports our town employees. There's been a little bit of a negative tone lately, and that's why I wanted to come and speak today. I feel like the budget didn't pass again, and I think that there were a lot of misleading things going around that caused people to vote against it. Um, taxes is a five-letter word, but it should be a four-letter word, and I don't like to pay taxes any more than anybody else in this town, but I do. We all want roads that are well-maintained, we want ample police officers to protect us. We want libraries. We want a lot of things. And that means we have to pay for them. I want to live in a vibrant town where businesses want to come and grow here, where people want to live here. I feel like people have been talking to me lately from out of town, and that vibe, that tone, is not what they're hearing about our town. 
Here are some facts that I just wanted to bring up. I know the salary increases for town employees um, was a big controversial thing, and that was based on cost of living adjustment. Yes, it seems like a big increase, but there are many people in all industries that are making a lot more than the cost of living. Um, and also, it includes people on Social Security. Fact, for a number of years, and certainly since the start of COVID, our town has put off or cut the budget on a number of projects that now have to be dealt with. Um, like our roads, law enforcement, and on and on. We can keep kicking those cans down the road and we'll most likely continue to do so if the budget gets cut anymore. I wonder who will be the first residents to complain about things that happen because we've cut the budget. I don't want, my personal feeling is I don't want to nickel and dime this budget. I'm sorry that it didn't pass last time, but at the same time, if we're really just saving things, the amount of money like going out to dinner or a few six packs of beer and cutting things that would, that would be for the whole year, I, I don't agree with that. Let's move forward and make this the very best town that we can. Let's work together, not against each other. Thank you. Who hasn't spoken yet, Tom? Anna McCormick, Recreation Coordinator. Um, thank you, Allison, for all of your words advocating for recreation in our community. Um, I just, I have lived in Morrisville for the last almost 10 years. Um, I grew up here, I went to school here. Um, I've worked with the community, with elderly folks in our community, with the youth for the last 15 years. Um, I have a lot of connections, a lot of forged relationships with families. Um, and I really appreciate the tone of advocating for health and wellness in our community, um, and that really being a protective factor for the families in our community as a whole. Um, right now we have 120 campers enrolled in our summer camp program. Um, we are <clears throat> staffing with 20 youth from our community. So that's 140 youth in our community that have a safe place to be, that are being fed meals every day for free by the school. Um, they have healthy activities being planned and provided for them. Um, and that is just such a, a resource for our town. Um, that is what I do in the summer. In the winter, when I am part-time, um, I think I'll just preface that by saying I applied for this job coming from a position where I was taking a pay cut to apply for this job. Um, I saw that it was posted in our town um, on our website, and I was really excited about that. Um, I love working with families in our community. I love the idea of recreation and health and wellness being just growing in our community. Um, so I applied for that job. When I was hired, I was told that it was going to be moving to a full-time position. That is not my idea. That is what was presented. Um, and for the last year, I've been being told that it would be a full-time position with full-time benefits. And I've just been waiting for that to happen. Um, I, I can't continue to just wait for that to happen. <laughs> I can't afford that. Um, I have to pay rent, and I have to support myself and my family. And um, <clears throat> But that being said, with the opportunity to move to full-time in the winter, I would have opportunities to apply for grants. Um, and if I don't have those hours in the winter, then I don't get the grants. Those, like, fall through January, March, um, those are when typical grant funding cycles open for applications. Um, and I just have a list here of grants, potential grants that I could apply for. I've already applied for two. Um, one was a $2,000 grant, one was a $6,000 grant. Um, but <clears throat> going forward, it would be a Ben and Jerry's Community Grant for $2,000, um, a Vermont Community Foundation Grant, <clears throat> the Green Mountain Fund for $5,000, 
a Spark Connecting Community Fund for up to $5,000. Um, through the Vermont Children's Trust Foundation, there would be an equip equipment grant available for $2,000. Um, a one-year program grants up to $10,000. Enhancements of recreation stewardship and access trails grants for $25,000. Vermont Outdoor Recreation Economic Collaborative Grant um, for a community grant program would be $50,000. Juvenile Delinquency Prevention Grant up to $15,000. Um, the A.D. Henderson Foundation, $15,000. The Agnes M. Lindsay Trust for $5,000, and the Room for Me grant, which would be $50,000. Um, that being said, the grants that I applied for, um, that I was able to secure for the current, well, we've passed the current fiscal year that I'm talking about, so it would be the 2022-2023 fiscal year. Um, I applied for a Ben and Jerry's grant, which was $2,000, and a um, Green Mountain Fund grant, which was $5,000. And I was able to use that for staff training, for staff payroll. Um, so being given time and the opportunity to do, do that, I could really help to um, fund some of our line items in our recreation program. Your, your program would be, your position would be one of the only positions, one of the few positions that would bring in revenue to the town, mm -hmm. right? If you were here full time. Yep. Yes. What you just listed was $182,000 with potential grants that are available yep. for recreation programs if you had the opportunity to be able to apply for those. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Tony Cody, Cody Hill. So, these last three women that talked, I support them 100%. What I don't support is the taxpayers paying for this. I think you need to find your money at grants. You're 100%. You should be on grants 100%, not the taxpayers. Taxpayers don't need to be doing this. Taxpayers pay enough tax. Now, I got a couple, I got a couple why questions for the board now. If, and I'm going to direct it to Don, because Don and I get along probably the best, I guess. So Don, why do we need a human resource officer? Why do we need a uh, HR director? For about 50 employees would be my estimate. Yeah, for about 50 employees. Yeah. That's basically why right there, this person, uh, our HR director, oversees a very large number of employees. And what's your responsibilities? Overseas. Right here. Okay, I'll take it. Three, Thank you. three pages Thanks. for you. And that can be posted on the website so folks can have and, and other towns this size has got this? Yes. Probably, mm -hmm. yes. I don't have a list of all those towns, but, and I will say, this individual that works for the town of Morrisville saves our administration a lot of time and a lot of money working out problems that <coughs> that happen when you have 50 employees sure. and it's probably in the past year or since i've been on this board has probably paid for their salary in terms of the amount of um dis uh how do i want to say this disputes um disagreements that could have gone to litigation that okay. could have gone to hiring lawyers i understand so I think it's money very so, much. So, so with the town manager, do you still think we need an, a, a uh, human resources? Yeah, I think so. I think the town manager okay, needs an fine. HR director to work with. Yes, they can't do it all on their own, but they, yes, yeah. Just want to get your wise, okay? Now, why should the taxpayer pay for recreation services when we pay for school tax? I think you just heard a great explanation yep. of why we're from, from two different individuals about why we need a recreation coordinator. Um, the first individual that came up here, you know, told you a little bit of the history of what it was like before we had a rec coordinator. And you've heard from the rec coordinator. You've heard what kind of money she's already brought in here, working part time, and you've heard what the potential is for money coming in in the future. And we're talking for 140 kids. We're talking for uh, that many kids during the summertime, but there's all the programs that take place year round. So she's not only doing, this individual isn't only doing the summer camp. 
there are lots of there's lots of uh, programs that, are, that would take place year round, working not just with kids but working with adults as well. It's okay. Uh, why do we have two assistants at the town clerk's office? Why do we have two assistants at the town clerk's office? Um, now there's nothing funny here. This is money. This is money. Now we're moving outside the box. Here. No, we're not. In I got a list of, here. I want. I want answers. Of, in terms of where my purview has been, uh, which has mostly been with the highway department. So I'm going to let Sarah answer why she has two assistants there. I don't. I, I don't know the answer. To that. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Um. Not only is it the town clerk's office, it's also the town treasurer's office and the delinquent tax collector office. Um, I will tell you that when I talk to other towns that are bigger than us, they have separate departments for that. They're surprised that I don't have more staff. I actually talked to Eric about like forward planning and in like five years I could need um, additional help in my office. We collect um, taxes, we collect delinquent taxes, we run all of the elections that now seem to be every other month. We um, have to do all of the recording for town. Uh, we collect dog licenses. We are the keeper of all the records in the vault. Yesterday I had somebody from the state working with me all day. She came and um, worked with me on the restoration of the grand lists that I have inherited that were in the basement. Um, they, are not, they were not well maintained. Um, totally free money. She she helped me clean them and box them up and um, bring them up um, to the state. Uh, we issue Green Mountain passports that if you don't know if you're a veteran or 62 years age of older, you can get a free um, park pass. We do DMV renewals. We issue birth certificates. We issue death certificates. We um, uh, collect burial transit permits. So we give. Um, permission when people um, die. We collect all of the money in the town. Um, I reconcile all of the bank statement and oversee the work that the finance department does. I, I uh, double check their, their work. I can go on, but those are a few things that I do. Tony, if I can just add. I want to talk to her is, first. She is one heck of a resource. When we have questions about statute issues, when we have questions like we've addressed tonight, you know, filling these vacancies on this board, she does that work for us and she does it very well for us. And she's also recognized statewide for her efforts and her education and her licensing. And I believe there's uh, an international aspect to her recognition as well. We are darn lucky to have Sarah Haskins and those two other individuals. Um, so your fault in my question, trying to make me look like a fool. I That's all right, though, Don. I'm answering as best she I was going to commend her for giving me that answer. That's the kind of answers that the town deserves right there. So thank you, OK? Uh, that's the kind of answers the town deserves. It doesn't deserve to be put on the back burner. Now, you guys are not working with us, but she is. Thank you, Sarah. How about the listers? How many listers do we have? And now that the new appraisals are out, why do we need so many listers? Do we have two, three listers? I don't know. Three. I'm not three. sure. Three. We have two. Just a three. question. They're elected. Yeah, that's, they're elected. That's, that's a question, OK? Yeah, they're two elected listers. We have three. And, and now what are they doing? Three. three. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't. Well, you answered the question. I, I know that we have listers. That's all I know about it. What they do, I don't know. What do they get paid? Tony. Tony. Yep. Tony. Yeah, Tony. Tony. Address the chair. We get to address the chair. Thank you. Um, we may not have all these answers for you right now, but we can get them for you. I can help with the listers answer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 
We have three elected listers. It's statutorily we need to elect three um, listers unless the voters vote to just go to an assessor. We do have an assessor that's paid, uh, I think, I don't know how she's paid, but um, who does the bulk of the work and we have a listing coordinator. The three elected um, listers are kind of a name only. Yeah. They don't, they don't work very many hours except to um, fill vacation times and sit in grievance hearances and um, they come and today they came and signed Yeah, it's pretty yeah, all three. Yeah, all three, yeah. Uh, community developer. Yeah, what's the reason why we need it? For the taxpayers? When we look around this town, our community development coordinator, in my opinion, is doing just a fantastic job. Look at all the, we were commended. I'll answer your question partly this way. Last week we had um, a ribbon cutting ceremony for the Hutchin Street apartment and we had people from all over the state coming in here for that project. We were commended for all the artwork that you see around town. That's just one small thing of what she does uh, and so at least that stuck out enough for, for that commendation. Look at the flowers that are around town. Look at what happened two, day, two days ago. What is it, July 6th today, I believe? July 4th, you can thank her for much of what happened on that day. Look at the, uh, uh, the music festivals that we have down the Oxbow. Is that, is that a full-time job? Is that a full-time job? I thank you, it is, yes. Yeah, her job is a full-time job. But, but there's a wonderful example, Tony, of where where, where she's working with local businesses to bring large numbers of people into this town that yeah. support our businesses. And we've heard about this. We've heard about our businesses and how they're being affected negatively. Well, there's a wonderful example. This of ain't negative. I'm, I'm asking. I, I want to know what... a conversation tonight. Several people have brought that up. Yeah. I think Laura alluded to that a little bit earlier, but um, maybe not tonight, but certainly in previous meetings. But um, it was... I. I I wholeheartedly support her position. Okay, thank you. She's online, Donna. She's thank you. I'm not done talking yet, though. Uh, EMS department. So tell, what would you like to Bill? say about the EMS? I want to commend him for what he does. Thank you. And I think, and I think he deserves another new ambulance. Okay, that's where the money should be going. It is. Okay. But I think he's getting a new ambulance. Yes, he, yes, is. he is. Well, maybe he needs another one next year. <laughs> <laughs> we got we to gotta get the staff pay up over there. But at the same time, there's other communities that should be paying for this. Keep that in mind. When they do ambulance runs all around, all around 10, 15 miles away, they should be paying. We're, and, we're and working on that. That's, that's I'm not just that's saying paying for the service. I'm saying paying. There, it's been a plan that's been working on how long does it take to work Laura well we it, there's a lot of contracts and stuff and numbers and it's it's being worked on and Bill can speak more to it I would knock on the door of Johnson's Community Center over there or their offices and say I want a million dollars well if, I would love to do that well, but Tony, yes, Tony yes. this is something I think you know this Eric Dodge was working on this yeah he, he went directly to the uh, town of Elmore, and they're not right. paying us for some of their some of our services. Yeah. Fire department, excellent, excellent service, excellent all the time. Can't say nothing about them. Zero cuts. Police department, same way, perfect. Why not? We got the best police department around. Highway department. Why do we need uh, three supervisors? Well, we have, we have one foreman in charge of the village garage, as you know, and that takes care of much of what, as the name would suggest, it, it takes care of the village and the needs in the village. We have a town garage. Uh, we have a foreman there. Right now we have two garages. We need two foremen. Maybe in the future, we've talked a lot about consolidating 
uh, Chris has brought up recently, I brought up a year ago, the whole idea of, of consolidating the garages up on Cochrane Road. That makes a lot of sense. Right now we're paying a lot of money to rent that garage up at the old Creamery Road. It's, you know, we're paying somewhere in the order of $100,000 a year for that. Um, maybe when the two garages are put together, I'm not saying this should happen, but maybe we'll go down to one format. I don't know. But right now we have two crews separated in two different distinct locations needing to form it. And so what I get out of my list is zero cuts for employees. Say that again. I'm getting zero cuts. Okay. That's for what you've asked me. Yeah. yeah. For what I asked you, I'm getting zero nothing from the budget. I, I nothing you've yeah. I, I nothing here makes sense to you. I understand your questions, Tony. I understand all of this. You know, I, okay. I understand. I can accept that. I, I but when the budget comes out. And you know I understand this. You and I have had lots of conversations. And I, I, I get it. But I also get the other side of it. You know, I get the side of listening to these employees and listening to what they're doing for our community. It's really hard for me just to put that in the back burner and pretend like that's not important. You know? So when I sit down with Kevin and I listen to what's going on, what's really, what these, what these, uh, I was gonna say men and women, but I think it's an all male force right now. Uh, what these men are, 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 are doing, there's a lot going on. Yeah. There's a lot going on. You can't not, tell it by me not right enough. now. Not enough. I you know. can't tell it by me right now. Not when I can't even drive on my road. Thank you. I've had enough. So we have, we don't have more hands up. So we, it sounds as if we have, oh, I'm sorry, sir. Oh, okay, yes. Jason Luno, the police chief. I just wanted to address the added police officer position. Uh, you know, the purpose of adding this position, as we all know, the town has grown over the last five or 10 years. And when the town grows, our infrastructure needs to grow. We have seen our incidents increase pretty significantly. And I ran some numbers today just to kind of updated numbers on January 1st to July 6th. You know, we're at a 32% increase in arrest. You back that to 2021, we're at a 96.6% uh, increase in arrest. And the purpose of this added position is so we can have two officers on duty 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, right now, 33% of the time, there's only one officer on duty. Now, depending on when people take vacations, training, court, that number could easily be extended to almost 50% of the day, one patrol officer on duty. With these increased number of arrests, where we're running, we have 135 arrests this year. When you, we arrest somebody, that's time consuming. That takes that officer out of pocket for responding to emergencies. So essentially the town is left with nobody to respond. We have to rely on our mutual aid partners down in Stowe or the sheriff's departments. We're also not able to do proactive patrols. Streets, uh, Lord brought up just driving a cruiser around is one of the best deterrents mm -hmm. there is. A quick story, yesterday, 9 a.m., a business right around the corner, there was one sole employee in there. She was in the bathroom. She comes out and there's a guy going through her drawers. And it turns out she confronted him, called us, he left. He ended up stealing, we believe, money out of that drawer. And this is at nine o'clock in the morning right here in the village. And these are the instances we're dealing with. Morrisville has turned into the hub of Lamoille County and we seem to be attracting a lot of people. We have a lot of social services organizations in town and is the numbers just continue to increase and increase and increase. And so does our workload. So above and beyond that, you know, there was a couple weekends ago where one officer was on by himself and handled 31 incidents and five arrests. That we're gonna burn our officers out if we continue doing this. Retention is so important. Law enforcement, if we hire a new police officer, it takes about a year to get them up and running. You know, the hiring process is about six weeks long, and then they need to go to the police academy, which is four months long. That's only offered twice a year, and then they have about three months of field training. So if I hired somebody today, they won't be working on the streets by themselves until probably a year from now. Recently, we've also picked up some added duties. We are now dealing with the animal control issues in town. We've tried to do this with, uh, Brian did it for years, then we tried somebody after Brian, and there was complaints made to the select board at the time, so the police department was tasked with enforcing this. 
Now that may not sound like a lot of work, but it is. So, and when you only got one patrol officer on and they're dealing with a dog issue, it's, it's significant. So, uh, besides that, we now have to, when we arrest somebody on an arrest warrant, the Sheriff's Department used to do the transports for us. When after hours, when the court's open, we can just go to the court, but when the court's closed, now we have to call in two people on overtime to drive these folks to St. Johnsbury to the correctional facility. And even more recently, Lamoille County Mental Health operated the Alcohol Substance Awareness Program, which is a building here in town that was staffed by mental health workers where we could bring intoxicated people to essentially sober off. You know, they're, if they're in our custody, protective custody, there's a reason for that. And that was an option for us locally. They had lost their funding and had to close. So now we need to call two people in who are not working to bring these individuals also to St. Johnsbury. This has happened already twice this week. Another reason is our overtime cost. Our overtime, we have $101,000 budgeted for overtime. Now granted, we've had a lot of significant calls in town over the past year, but a lot of that money is to cover the cost of providing shift coverage when somebody takes a day off. I've almost spent, I've doubled my overtime budget. It's 200, 205%. So it's a significant amount of time where if we had this 10th patrol officer in, we could have two people on duty with a shift supervisor in the middle, and we could potentially fill only an eight hour out of a 12 hour shift because we're gonna have the staff on site. And again, if we kick this can down the, down the road and wait a year, then it's really a year from there till we can actually get somebody hired and trained and, and working. And then on top of all that, we're also looking at some retirements coming up in a couple years. So, as soon as we stop dropping our numbers, I mean, it, it really will start impacting of how we can do our job. And I see um, that on front porch forum, Stowe is looking for officers. Yeah. Every police department is looking for officers right now. Jason, have you seen any kind of increase in people applying at all? Because I know there was there for a while. There was. It comes and goes. You know, we we right now we have one vacancy. We have a conditional offer out. Mm -hmm. um, she has to go through all the testing. So we'll see how that works out, but okay. that will give us our nine patrol officers. Yeah. So, so I, I just want to say something real quick here. You know, again, everybody, every I hear everyone's arguments, um, but the reality is the budget has failed twice. So I'm encouraging everybody. Let's start thinking creatively. What can, how can we come up with some solutions? Because again, I said they start. These were the extreme so i really encourage everybody to start thinking creatively how can we move forward uh get a budget um because i think that's what we need to kind of come up with some you know creative ways to get us through this horrible period so that we can go forward and i you know um again it's just it's re rethinking some of these positions how you know and I know that we, the full-time, part-time, you know, just, but I'm not, I don't have the answers, but I'm just hoping that people will start thinking about it and come up with some creative. Um, that's what, you know, because again, we, nobody's happy with any of these decisions and nobody here is going to contest anybody's argument, but we've got to figure out a way to go forward, we, you know. And I've given that some thought, yeah. and since we're gonna be, you know, if the budget passes in September, we're 25% through the fiscal year, so we could shave off about $25,000 of that, and it's 25,000 bucks. Yeah, so, so that's the kind of things we're looking for. Let's, you know, let's get crazy. Somebody on Zoom. And Julia's on okay. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna go to Zoom, and I'll, okay. Um, Kathy, could you identify yourself, please? Um, Kathy Chafee. So when that gentleman was talking and um, I tried to interrupt, I wanted to tell you, and I guess finance could probably ask the, answer this, but the federal government has a federal deep, deep, creation, deep creation handbook. And so when you buy something, um, if you look up in this federal handbook, it tells you how many years you can use that and write it off. And so every year, that's what you would put in your budget. So I don't know, $100,000 would break down to, I don't know how many years you would divide that by the years and that's what you would get for your payment. Um, but anyways, if you haven't looked at that book, somebody should actually look at it. It's very interesting and you can get a lot of information from it. 
Um, okay. I know what you're talking about, Kathy. You're talking about depreciation, but that is just an accounting function, and it doesn't put money back in your budget. It just um, basically gives you whatever you bought. It tells you what the useful life of it is, and you are able to take whatever portion of useful life and depreciate it every year. It doesn't have anything to do with actual cash money. Um, do do you um, do you do buying new equipment by that book? Like how many years do you use that for when you buy new equipment? Uh, we we use Gatsby, and yes, we I, we have probably nineteen million dollars worth of fixed assets, which is what you're talking about, that get depreciated every year. Okay, thank you for answering that. Um, Secondly, I'm a little confused on the library. Um, were they a line item and it was voted down by the taxpayers? Is that why they're coming back to us for money? No, it's in the it's in the budget that keeps getting voted down. They're trying right. to they're trying to protect the funding that was originally discussed. Um, that's why they're here. Oh, so, they don't, so, they don't want us. Yeah, they, there was an increase in this particular budget. Um, and um, they're trying to protect that, knowing that the, the budget has not been passed. So they're just trying to protect that, that's, that they're not a cut going forward. Oh, okay, just so I have it straight. They, in the first budget, they had an allotted amount. And when it wasn't passed, it was uh, it's so confusing. We've seen so many things. Then did you guys cut that out of the budget? And that's no, why they're no. coming back and asking? No. We they're protecting. Thank you. That's a good term. They're trying to protect um, that. Yeah. Okay. So um, this is, like you said, nobody's going to like anything. But this is my opinion. You don't want to cut pay but um you know there's three positions in there that are getting a 13,000 15,000 16,000 not quite sure on those 13 I know I'm right the other two I'm not 100% positive um I know they are but I don't know the um, total per perfect amount um they're getting up to 13 to 16,000 dollar raise in this budget that's just three of them each get between thirteen and sixteen thousand dollar raise. Um, to me, that's excessive for a year. So what I'm proposing, and you can look at this, and people didn't have a problem with it before, or we wouldn't have employees there for eight and sixteen or eighteen years. So my proposal is we go to a four point six percent raise this year. We take our steps and put them back where they were. We grandfather everyone in for their 25 year retirement that's there now. Going forward, we go back to what we had. So. Um, we, the, part of the conversation was that we have union contracts that yeah, we this legally. This is non union. This is non union. Yeah. Um, but the, then it becomes you're targeting one group. Um, and again, part of this, you know, happened um, last year. They were uh, trying to make adjustments because they were underpaid. You know, the timing was horrible. Um, you know, is the bottom line, and nobody, nobody's questioning that anybody deserves it. Um, but going forward, that's why we're talking about we're going to address the longevity pay, pay again going forward. Um, but at this point, we're tied in with union that we can't touch it. Um, and the negative impact to target a certain group um, has, from what I understand, is no one's willing to do that. And it, that's, uh, that's where we are. You know, you certainly put it out there. So, um, but, every, you know, that's that's okay. was kind of the bigger description, bigger over plan. Yeah. Well, you can't blame the taxpayers if it doesn't pass this time. Yeah. Yeah. Julian. Yeah. 
Uh, Julia Campagna, Morristown. Um, I applaud everyone's contributions tonight because it feels like we're having um, tangible conversations and uh, sharing of information and everybody's analysis has been great. And I love that the board is looking to be creative. You are creative in appointing Jason, you're creative in um, some of the internal transitions that you're doing and you're asking for additional input uh, in that light, given the circumstances that we're in. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Maybe it's just not meant to be. Um, so I'm not asking these questions and expecting answers tonight. I would just like to put forth these thoughts and see if, if it's anything that um, you bring to the table uh, further in your working um, sessions and examining the budget. So um, was mentioned tonight that the capital reserve amounts that we voted at at town meeting have somewhat tied your hands. And I wonder if in a revote of the budget, is it possible to adjust those capital reserve figures reflective of the grand list? And is that a temporary solution? Our expert is saying no. OK, so those are now. OK, I didn't need an answer right now, but thank you, Sarah. Um, Seems to be clear. The is another thought. Is there restructuring of debt in the sense of, in my personal business, if a self-employed business owner, if I were struggling during a hardship of financial times, I might go back to my lender and say, could I make interest-only payments for this year or for these months or this period of time to get me over the hump of a hardship? Um, in supply chain or in inflationary measures. So is that something that could be looked at? Um, with Jason's um, talk about the uh, f funding the extra police position, there used to be a program called the COPS grant program. Have we availed ourselves of the COPS grant? And lastly, if we are, in spite of everybody's collaborative effort, which I'm glad to see tonight, uh, we're moving past um, the dispute and working together is if we do end up with a budget that is still going to be very difficult for people, could Sarah, because Sarah's the wellspring of information here, could we look at Title 32 and could we possibly have the board vote to forgo tax sales, delinquent tax collection for a period of one or two years on new tax foreclosures because if everybody is in the position that we're in and we have to raise th the rate and the percentage and the taxes exponentially in reaction to that can we give people a period of time a moratorium on tax sales not the existing ones that are already in the pipeline but going forward for a period of a year or two to give people the time to regroup and decide, do I need to sell? Do I need to refinance? Do I need to break off some land and bring in some revenue to carry me through this time? So thinking outside of the box, that's just some ideas. I don't need answers. I just wanted to put them out there. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I had some other people. Christy, you had your hand up. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if you've come up or not. Yeah. Okay. Christy Snip, please give Jason his officer. <laughs> I don't think there's going to be a person in this town that's going to say that we don't need it. Um, also, I worry a little bit about um, these short-term gains and the long-term pain we may feel from them. I'm not sure it makes sense to not bring our rec position to full-time for $40,000 if the revenue we would get from that would be four and a half times what the expense of doing that is. And in terms of the library, um, the cost of having to pay for benefits for the library employees would be a lot greater. And if that's what the long-term ramification of cutting their funding is, then I don't think it's a wise uh, decision. Thank you. So I want to make sure. What? Is it all right if I say something? Yes. Uh, what do I do? I think we have a couple other hands. Sure, up. We have a couple other hands. Right, we had, uh, I'm going to go, people haven't spoken yet, sir, go ahead. Uh, my name is Juana Paris, Earl Gray Road. Um, I think there's been a lot of ideas about how to cut and, and save the money. The fact of the matter is, 
it's going to be up to you four or five to figure out how we could get it passed. And if and I think that it needs to be right around where the CPI is, because most people are really upset and they're not going to accept anything, you know, I mean, it needs to be seven, eight, somewhere in that category. Otherwise, we're going to have more meetings to talk about how we get below the number that you folks come up with. So that's just my thought. And another thought is you're talking about this year. I don't see the economy changing for the next couple of years. So, you know, this inflation that we're having now, don't think January 1 of 2024, the, the world's all a better place. It's not happening. So these meetings, this stuff is going to continue to go on. Now, I'm all in favor of cutting the budget. There's only one spot that I know we've already cut, which is the road department, which is like the asphalting in Mooresville. After coming to these meetings and listening, listening to Mr. Cody, I decided to drive up on Cody Hill. And I did the, the loop, the, wow. the, mud, the mud loop and all that. And uh, I live you know, off the Randolph Road, and anybody that drives the Randolph Road knows how bad that is. And so you know, roads are like maintenance. You know, pay me now or pay me later, but later is usually more. A lot of these roads, if they don't get some help, when we get around to fixing them, the road crew is going to be out there with a D8 digging it all up and starting from scratch. I mean, these roads are getting to the point where they're not going to be able to save them by doing a patch or shimming, any of those kind of things. So I, I would like to see the town come up with a, um, shall we call it a road plan, where all the roads that are in Mooresville have a percentage of, you know, this is an A road, a B road. And when we get down to the D and the F, those are the ones that need help and get with the road people to figure out what gives us the biggest bang for the dollar to save. Because some of these roads are getting to the point where it's just, just I mean, as a taxpayer, I find it abysmal that I have to drive on a truck wagon road. So anyways, and I know we've already scratched that 190000 for asphalting which is, we're going the wrong direction here. But I mean, you know, next year, we're gonna need like maybe twice as much. And where are we gonna come up with money next year because we didn't do anything this year? So it's kind of like a domino effect. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it is. Um, hold on a second. Um, just start back here. Uh, Jamie Jarrett. I want to commend Jason, first of all. Last meeting, I brought up the fact of department heads coming forward with what their plan was. And prior to today's meeting, Jason came and seeked me out, and he gave me his what his proposal is. So Jason, thank you very much. And I'm totally on board with what you have. So thank you very much again. The only thing I can say is right now we're, at, we're in a quandary. Right, and what we need to do is figure out where can we cut expenses. Let's not even bother talking about pay raises because that's going to happen. That's a that's a fact. Okay, all we can do is address what we do in the future. But again, what I brought up last week, and I'll do it again today, is I challenge two two departments in particular, and that's general government and the highway department to go back to their budgets and let's be as honest and as best we can to predict what kind of budgeting we need to have. Thank you. And just so you know, Jamie, some of that's already begun and I've been talking to Kevin and I, we've, had, we've identified some significant cuts in the highway department. We're talking in excess of $100,000. So yes. That's the only yeah. place you're going to end up. And, you know, yeah. Chris has alluded to them. Yeah. Um, yeah, part of it is these two trucks that, even if we ordered them today, we wouldn't get them this fiscal year. So there's no sense in budgeting that. Or, well, maybe there is, but I'll just mm -hmm. throw it out there. We're looking at that. And another thing is uh, the price of salt's gone down. So we may have a 
we may have said. So the only thing is, and, and I think Bob well, brought what, it up. What? So who can hear uh, the only other piece there uh, relative to what you're speaking about is is the uh, gravel and all. What we didn't discuss was there is going to be a fee from uh, Percy. Mm -hmm. So it's not a case of we don't have to pay anything for the gravel. There will be an expense for the gravel extraction. So. But we seem, it looks like we're going to be able to have Percy produce it cheaper than we could right. yeah, yeah. 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 I'm trying to get people out. I haven't spoken yet. Um, yeah, I would definitely encourage people to, you guys, oh, Evelyn uh, Throne Morrisville. Um, I would encourage looking at some of the highway department. Um, it, you know, they're maybe less salting or less plowing at times could be done because sometimes it comes by and it's a quarter inch a half inch and it's coming down our road at 3 a.m. and I wonder if that's something that could be looked at that wouldn't help a lot but it would help some but I would like the idea of uh, to speak for just one minute on the idea of preventative and I think you, Jason made a very good point that when that facility that where people who were inebriated could go shut down, it cost money. It cost time, power, it cost burnout, it cost money. Um, we need to look at something like the rec department in that same light, I think. Uh, this is this is will help people not be burned out. It could help the entire community be healthier emotionally. We don't know what that could translate to, to uh, financial or any other cost. But it's it, you know grants are great, and I agree with Tony. We should look at grants in every f every chance we can get. But my little bit of experience I have with them, they don't write themselves. They are so time-consuming and difficult. You can't uh, wait for volunteers to do that. Someone has to be on the clock, sitting there, taking their time to do it, and they have to be good at it, <laughs> or else they're not going to get the grant. They're not going to write it correctly. They're not going to know how to write it. They're not going to know how to look for it. So I think that that's, like, that is a huge bonus to this town, and it's part of the preventative thing that I'm imagining all police officers would have some uh, amount of um, appreciation for, and we all should have appreciation for that. Thank you for extending the two minutes. Uh, <laughs> uh, I and, and, I, and I hope in the future that we can do the same thing. There's been a lot of interest in talk about how to fix the budget. A lot of ideas. Uh, and, and they're helpful. They are helpful. And that's what we need. We need more of it from more people to come here and express their views. And, and, uh, and I'm not going to agree with all of them. Of course, it would, and that's what it's all about. If we all agree together, then we would need all of us, right? We just need one. And, and, uh, but my point to be made is that the last budget was overwhelmingly defeated. And it was at 12.6. And there's a reason for that. It's because these people cannot afford it. We agree you need all these services, but you also have to have somebody that can pay for them. And there are people out there that cannot, that are scared they'll lose their property. Whether they do or not, I don't know. But there are people that are afraid they're going to lose their properties. And the homesteader, that's good at yours, but there's people afraid that that homestead is going to go down because our, our appraisals went up. So there's all kinds of things going on that we have no control over. But you're asking us to pay for all this stuff. You know, your, your morale, your morale, the morale of the, I know a little bit of something about morale. And I'll tell you one thing, for your whole community, your business, your company, whatever it is, the morale counts for everybody. And right now, the voters' morale is in the dumps. 
and you've got to do something about getting their morale up. So they vote yes. And by constantly saying it's only going to be 30 bucks, or you can, we can't let this go because of, of whatever reason, that isn't helping their morale, and it's not going to help them to, to change their mind to vote yes because they can't afford it. So the only solution I see, and it's tough, to, tough. I can't tell you how to, what to cut, but something has to be cut, and that 12.6, and I hope these new figures you get can help out, it's got to get around not 8% before you can be assured that it'll pass. And even then, these people are so mad, there's no guarantee of that. But it's gonna help by getting everybody here, everybody expressing their views. But don't lose the bottom line, is people gotta pay for it. 20, there's over a thousand people in this town, over 65, on a fixed budget, fixed income. So think of those people. Somebody's got to think of it. Thank you. That's all. Okay. Hi, I'm Alex Sear, and I've been thinking about the best way to put this, and I'm not sure that I found a great way. Um, but I've been really concerned over the last couple of months over how many resignations the select board has had to accept, and. I certainly don't begrudge people who have moved to other places, um, but you know, especially last week when the select board had to sort of, without warning, move immediately to executive session to con to consider a personnel matter. You know, I was really concerned. You know, what the town might be losing, and I don't want to downplay Travis's contribution, but it could have been a lot worse than just one select board member, and I'm worried that if we do keep having every week, twice a week, a deep dive into town salaries, we are going to be losing a lot more. And I don't want to be here telling people what they can and can't say, but I hope you know the select board will kind of stay the course on that issue. Thank you. Oh, Stephanie, I'm sorry. Steph Hoffman, I just wanted to speak um, on Anna's behalf, having served as the chair of the Recreation Committee um, while it was volunteer-based. I know what that job requires, um, and I wrote grants is a part -time, on a part-time basis, and I wrote one grant that took over 40 hours in and of itself on your off time. If we want that return, you have to invest in the time for the staff person. Rec is also not just the summer program. The summer program itself requires work from late February at the latest until September to wrap all the reporting requirements. So you're really talking about a four to five month period. We ran programming. We started at a seed level running programming three to four events a month year round. If you look at other rec programs that we are aiming to emulate, Throughout the state, they have robust winter programs. We have a skating rink. That's not open in the summer. It's a recreational asset of the town that gets utilized and maximized to its best potential by having someone who can pour efforts and programming around that, that collaborate with other agencies and other departments in the town and nonprofits and businesses. And there's a really collaborative environment that that creates. And I'll say at a larger level, and so I fully support that position being full-time. I always have. I advocated for that when we transition because I think that it's necessary. If we want to have a recreation department that can support this programming, the research fully supports it being um, not just self-sustaining economically in the direct way, but in indirect ways as well. There are legal ramifications to not having a part-time or full-time employee running that program that saved the town a ton of money on a prevention level. There is collaborative ways that our law enforcement and crime rates and other opportunities for um, vandalism, et cetera, get reduced when you have programming for kids after school, when you have people engaged in their community at all levels. We served folks at all different ages and all different, um, in all different settings. And rec means a lot more than you think it does, so it's a great place for growth and expansion and collaboration. But when you look at the things that we're attacking, which I feel like that's kind of the tone we're all talking about, I just wanted to say if we flipped it and looked at it a different way. 
if we all came back to this table and said, this is where we can make a, a concession, yes. how can we make that concession, which is the theme we're hearing, but how can we also look at that as how is it, how is it gonna be affordable? Right, that's what people are saying. That doesn't necessarily mean cutting the budget. That can mean some of these other solutions like, I think we have some misconceptions about the homestead. I'm really glad you brought that up because it, it actually phases out at I think $135,000 income level, not 45, um, but that might be total coverage of the new tax burden. So people need to go to these calculators that exist on the state's website. Uh, the increase in social security level has b benefits long term because that's always gonna go up with QPI, but also is there a, a relief we can provide people with delinquency? Are there other ways that on the paying side we can get some relief temporarily to get us through this. 8%, 7%, 6%, 5%, 2%. We will face this year after year after year after year if we don't deal with it now. So we can say 10, we can say 9, we can say 8. Next year it'll be 10, it'll start at 22. We will have the same exact cycle. As someone who's working on the budget for the next fiscal year and waiting to know what our appropriation checks are going to be if they're coming at all at the library, I just want to say we have to find a solution. And as a community, I really trust that we can. And I think we need to do that from both ends. And we need to support each other. If your neighbor needs help, these community services are the places they go for that help. So let's not take them away. Thank what you. The, um, what's the place to calculate? The state website. I'm sorry, what's, I don't know your it, name. But it's called, what's it called? Jerry. If you go to the tax department's website, okay. There's a calculator for the Homestead Declaration that lets you put in the variable similar to the calculator that's available on the town's website for the new tax amount. And you can put in that information into the state's website so that you, with your new appraisal, and you can get it. It actually is adjusted based on what your taxes are as well. Like, what is your municipal tax amount? We have that on our website, don't we, or not? We have, a, we have a, I have, I'm sorry. I have on my property tax um, page, I have tons of pages on my yeah. website of clerk and treasurer. So on treasurer property tax, I'm pretty sure there's all information about the homestead that will link you to the state's oh, cool. page. I have oh, lots orders. of resources on my website. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Thank so you. I think instead of being afraid, we should try to provide information to folks that are facing these difficulties and come at that problem from that angle as well. Good idea. Provide support so people aren't afraid of something that might not actually be real. Yes. I know, I know Chris, Chris was yeah. there. I was going to kind of ask to make an announcement at the end, but I think this might be a good time to share that um, I know people are really concerned about that education education tax rate and we haven't had a number normally the state provides that July 1st um, they did for all towns that are not going under reappraisal so if you go to the state's website right now um, the tax rate for Morristown is not on there they're waiting for um, our grievances to end and the listers to finalize the um, 411 in the, in the grand list after grievance. That happened today. We signed it. The lister submitted the figures. So I'm hopeful that by the end of next week, we should hopefully have some education tax rate. Because I know um, people have been really concerned about those and, figures and also. That'll be the, the school tax rate? The school tax that'll rate. That'll be when it's happening. Yeah. Okay. Good, good to know. And I'm going to ask a question as town clerk, and don't be mad, but as a department head, I need some guidance on elections and my budget. Um, what your thoughts are for town meeting, if you are thinking that you're going to mail all your ballots or not, because that'll change what I do in um, my budget. To, you want to make that decision. You don't need to make this. I, you don't need to make that decision right now, but before this budget gets finalized, I, I kind of need that guidance, what you're thinking about for March, because it, mailing um, all the ballots is, could be the difference, you know, $10,000 or not in my budget. I've been including it, but maybe you, you don't, and it's not my decision at all to make. And, and it, now we're going to have an election for two board members, so it, I, I realize that um, that answer won't be made probably till January, but I would like some direction from the board whether or not I should include that in my budget or not. So Thanks. we don't need to make this decision before we do, before we, we what is it, July? I don't know the you don't, you don't need to set it in stone, but I need some guidance if I should include it um, before this is 
finalized or not. Okay. Okay, Chris. So, in the spirit of creativity, um, one of the things that um, we've been talking with the finance department about is, you know, some, I guess, uh, more specific numbers, uh, more um, finalized numbers in terms of what we can project on to this next fiscal year. And uh, thank you, Tina, for doing that. Um, there is a number of items from general fund to EMS, and these are basically some adjustments based on part-time uh, wages and with benefits, um, salt prices updated and the tonnage used in the highway department, um, the, the uh, elimination of the two payments of the two trucks that we were uh, hoping to uh, purchase or purchase this coming year, this year, uh, along with uh, in the general fund some uncompensated absences. There's you know savings there. So what it totals down to. And what I haven't included in this, it comes down to $123,000 in actual savings. So that's that's, huge. that's going to be coming into this uh, this, this um, budget. The, what that doesn't include, Jason, is what you said uh, was the $25,000 um, that could be expected to be saved if you don't hire somebody until <coughs> September. So that actually goes to 150,000. That yeah. number, and that that's still an ac accurate number. Tina, is that correct? Yes. Um, in addition to that, you know, I've had some conversations with the finance department about, you know, fund balances in other departments. And this year, in the highway department, because of the winter, uh, late winter that we had, and such, um, we were projecting a fund balance in that department as well. And I know that I talked with Tina about this, and she, and she ballparked the number, and I, I, I don't want to hold you to this, um, but the number that we were talking about presumably is over $100,000. Is that still fairly correct? Um, as of right now, I would say that that's fairly safe. Um, in looking at all of the uh, expenses for all the departments, we, if you put them all together, we did not overspend, we underspent. However, there are more bills to be coming, but we also um, got more revenue than what we anticipated getting too, which is always a great thing to have happen. So I think $100,000 is a fairly safe bet so far. I don't see anything coming through that's going to be huge. So I would you know, say we might have around $100,000 fund balance. So, so that money, uh, those are tax dollars that we've already spent. And to utilize those tax dollars we've already spent, applied to tax dollars that we're about to spend, and you couple that with the adjustments in the different departments in terms of savings, it's $250,000. So, you know, I know that we've talked a lot about cutting here and cutting there, but this is actual dollars that we can apply toward this budget to reduce the amount of taxes to be paid, um, which is significant. It's a quarter of a million dollars. And I think that that's a great start in terms of where we want to get so that we can get the bulk of this community on board uh, and still support the services that we're providing. So, spirit of cre uh, creativity. Yeah. But this was exact. This was what you proposed last time too. Was using the funds correct? No. No. Uh, this is this so, is money that's already. So so yeah, separate. Let's just get that clear. So, <laughs> so separate from that. Uh, what we ended up doing, um, and it was uh, it was Article Seven, it said that shall the voters establish a reserve fund to be called the unallocated reserve fund to replace both the general fund unallocated reserve fund and the highway fund unallocated reserve fund in the amount 
not to exceed 10% of the prior year's operating budget to be used for covering unanticipated revenue shortfalls and to pay unanticipated expenditures in accordance to the state statute. So we've been talking about this as being an emergency fund, and I guess you could call it that, but it's a, a, a general fund unallocated reserve fund that cannot exceed 10% per the voters' vote. So part of this budget that we originally talked about was taking $240,000 out of this unallocated reserve fund because you can only have up to 10% of the prior year's uh, base operating budget. And if we're, if we're doing that calculation, that would be $666,000. We currently have about eight ninety dollars in there. Is that correct, Tina? Yeah, the fund balance is at eight ninety dollars from last year. And the unallocated reserve fund, um, according to what was voted, cannot exceed six hundred and sixty-six. You're right. you're right. So that leaves, you know, that two hundred and forty that we wanted to inject back in the budget. It's not part of the emergency fund. It can't be. Right. Um, right. And the whole purpose of that is to defray the cost of taxes in the next year. So the two hundred and forty is being used exactly how it's intended to be used. Right. So. Again, it's tax dollars that we've already paid to help defer tax, uh, tax dollars that we're going to be required to pay in this next budget. So that's the 240 that we're talking about. This, this um, budget adjustment here and the fund balance that is projected to come out of the highway department is in addition to that. So when we're talking about getting to a certain percentage in the budget, um, here lies close to a quarter of a million dollars to help us get there. And I know that Tina uh, ran some projections uh, based on um, the new appraisal and the uh, three special articles that we voted in in March, the two and a half cents that now will allocate more money because of the reappraisal. Um, if we were to get to uh, nine under ten percent nine and a half percent I guess um, we would need to cut three hundred fifty thousand dollars out of this budget so here lies two hundred fifty of that um, in in this information here so I think that all of the things that we've talked about tonight um, you know whether there's negotiations at all with um, you know with the library or any other um, areas that we can really look to uh, reallocate, um, we may be, be very close to that number. And uh, if people can be satisfied with that and vote positively uh, toward this budget, um, I think we're, we could be pretty close to an agreement on how we move forward. Again, everything that we don't do now, and I think the Paris Paris has you know, spoke very well about this, you know, kicks this can down the road. And, uh, and it's gonna cost, I mean, just look at the trucks that we were uh, looking to purchase and the $150,000 that that's gonna cost in addition to order those things. I mean, that's, you know, it's, it's kind of foolish. And uh, so I think that we need to really keep our eye on the ball. Yes, we're gonna talk affordability. I think that we can make great strides with what I've just mentioned here. And uh, I think over the next couple of meetings, if we can uh, drill down a little bit harder, uh, we could be close. But I don't think we wanna cut off our nose and spite our face either. Thank you. So it seems that we've, done, we've had a lot of, got a lot of information from the public. Oh, sorry. Paul, you want to come up? I did see your hand before and I forgot. Sorry. Uh, my name is Paul Griswold, and I've lived in Morrisville most of my life, all except three months. But that gave me an opportunity to work for the town as a volunteer for the last 60 years. And I've met with a lot of committees. I've served on a lot of committees including the school board and the other seats I have not sat in as seats that you are sitting in. And I get concerned every year to look at the report and see all of these special allocations. 
uh, for Meals on Wheels. And, and these people are coming to you and saying, we want $10,000, $25,000. And it gets into the, uh, to the town report. It gets voted on. And everybody goes home happy. I added it up the other day in the current school, uh, slate board budget, and there's $130,000 being asked for by various organizations in town. For instance, one of them's home health, $15,680. And I thought, well, I wonder what they spend that for. So I looked at the report that they gave you that's in the end of the town report. And it's general, basically the way the report is up, uh, offered is they have generally operating budget that money goes into. And I thought to myself, what if they didn't have that, what effect would it have? And it would affect them to the point of $49 a day, less money. And if they can't build into their budget and their operating system, a savings of $49 a day, they, they ought to take a great look at what they're doing. For instance, justice for dogs, $1,000. Uh, if they didn't have that money, it would, it would cost them $3 a day. I think that we ought to change the way we do these, uh, allo these allotments. Uh, if you were to take a certain amount of money, 50, 75, $80,000, put it into a fund and let these people apply for it as grants. And maybe there'd be less grants, and then maybe there would be more meaningful grants, so the money, instead of in their general budget, it would be for specific items. Uh, simple as that. Can I, uh, can I speak to that? Because um, sure. I've been researching it for a couple years now, and we actually, uh, <clears throat> one of the things we did this year was get it on the ballot mm -hmm. so that the current appropriations that you see are were all elect, mm -hmm. all voted on. Um, the other information uh, is that we are under state statutes currently, um, which this is how the state statute allows it. In order for us to alter it, Stowe did this because Stowe had a tremendous problem where you know it, they just became an open wallet. So, uh, but in order for us to make any kind of um, plan that you're talking about requires us to have a charter governance. And then once we get that charter governance, we then can craft, um, you know, a solution or options uh, that then will go before the voters. Um, but again, we have mm -hmm. to, we have to get there. So, you know, we did make headways. Um, uh, and at this point, these were all um, elect, you know, were voted mm -hmm. on by the, um, by the folks so mm. it's a matter of you know it's certainly on my radar to you know to anticipate um trying to mm -hmm. and again it gets down to that we having some control over the budget so that we don't have these massive you know swings yeah. uh but finding something that's palatable to the fo to the voters um but the, we've got to get that charter governance first before we can so the door will never be closed uh, no, it will. There, we're, there's already been. There's already talk about it. It turns out the village already has a charter governance, mm -hmm. so there's already people looking into that. Mm -hmm. Can we join their charter, which will make it quicker? Mm -hmm. There's talk about a, a town manager, mm -hmm. but it's uh, you know the town manager has to be voted on. Nothing. Right. Okay. Nothing All happens right. quickly, but um, so that it's in the conversation. But um, thank you for your comments. I'm, I'm, and I'm sorry. More. I'm sorry. I'm late. No, you're not <laughs> late. We're in the middle of it, so you're not late. Uh, the other question I've got is uh, for the library, and she's gone, I guess. But she talked about endowments. Does anybody know what those endowments are? Whether they're insurance, bonds, or what? It's like the Copley Fund. They're Copley Funds. Yeah. I believe it's she. They they're, said it was they're stock market. They're invested in the stock market. Yeah. yeah. And, that's, and yeah. they have a certain amount that they try to pull out of that every year. Yeah, I was I was on the library board a few years ago, and they had a lot of money in Union Bank stock. Right. And, and they're trying not to touch the principal and just draw the <coughs> Well, I'm trying not to touch my principal to live either, so. I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Okay. The, um, I think... Sorry, Bill? 
Yeah, just briefly, I don't want to okay. everybody up longer. Um, I just want to interject here as a department head. Um, I am keenly aware when I put together our budget uh, that I am using somebody else's dollars. I'm keenly aware of that, uh, and we take uh, due diligence to that when we put together our budget. Uh, the budget that we are looking at, that's the EMS is part of, that's been defeated twice, um, we came in with a 3% increase. We've now cut that down to minus 3.2% uh, is what EMS budget is looking like. Um, uh, and I know I've brought this up before, but we're an agency that brings in almost $300,000 a year that goes into the town general fund. In the time it took to prepare that budget almost 10 months ago to now, uh, there has been a drastic change uh, in the EMS employment market coming out of COVID. Uh, and uh, agencies that don't have to answer to a select board, do not have to answer directly to taxpayers, um, have uh, increased the market rate value of EMS providers who were generally across the board undervalued to begin with, uh, to the point where my staff uh, is now in the lower third of providers within Lamoille County. Uh, I've got a part-timer who's leaving for a full-time job at another agency, and I'm hoping he's going to be able to stay on our schedule for his 24 hours a week. Um, uh, and it, and it's, it's not colloquial to us, but I would not be doing my due diligence to not make you aware that at some point, we've got to take a, long, a, a good look at market rate for my, for my staff. Yeah. Uh, we are, uh, uh, there was a time we were in the top third, now we're not. And that's, that's nobody's fault other than the competitiveness of trying to find qualified, certified, licensed EMS providers coming out of a pandemic and uh, com literally competing against agencies that don't have um, the budget constraints uh, that we have when we put together our budget. Um, so this is, this is coming down the road. Um, I appreciate the fact that Mr. Cody wants to get me more ambulances, but I need the staff to put on them. We have to have two people on every truck. My staff right now is pretty evenly divided, five full-time, five part-time, and five paid on call. Those paid on call people do this job for three dollars an hour stipend. Okay, and they're and they're as certified as the rest of my staff. Until the budget passes. Until the budget passes, and then they'll come up. They'll come up to fifteen an hour and be un, unbenefited town employees. So it's been on hold because the budget hasn't passed. Yes, ma'am. We can't pay our volunteers in the fire department nor the EMS because the budget hasn't right. passed. And then my other staff, my full-time staff, Corey and I are working chiefs. We staff trucks. Um, and just as an aside to that, when you're a working chief, you understand the value of having a full-time HR person who can uh, help guide you on personnel issues while I'm out answering 911 calls. So let me just throw that in there as my endorsement for that full-time HR slot that, that needs to stay. Um, my other staff, my part-time staff, um, up until July 1st, I had three of my part-time staff uh, who were making less than $18 an hour. Um, and that is, frankly, 5 to $7 under what other services in our district are paying, who, again, don't have the constraints of using taxpayer money and select board money. They're billing almost a million dollars a year in ambulance reimbursement. So. My due diligence is to make you aware of that. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, my staff is keenly aware of it because they, they see the numbers and they're hearing the numbers in other places. All right, thanks. Thank you. I just want to add, I'm, I'm the liaison and, uh, you know, my mom was a nurse for, you know, my whole life. And just to put it in context, think about $15 an hour 
that somebody is getting paid who will very potentially mean whether you're going to live or die. Yes. And that's, um, you know, I mean, to me, we, and so I greatly appreciate Bill and the fact that we've got to look, and this is part of the being proactive that, you know, yes, we're making a big uh, move this, this budget, but 15 is just a start. I mean, again, think about it. And certainly I think about it if they have to come you know, save me, you know, I want to make sure there's two coming because, you know, <laughs> I want to live. So just the, that, I think that's what we're thinking here is that we've got to be thinking ahead. So I'm going to take the last time, last person, Tyler, would you uh, identify yourself, please? Yep. Hi, uh, Tyler Mesha, Morrisville, uh, Meadow Drive. Um, just one question and, and two comments. Um, I know we have the, you know, the two tiered system of local government with having, you know, village trustees and then, uh, you know, and then a town select board. Is there any cost savings to be had? I'm not sure you could deal with it in this particular budget, but of trying to consolidate those into one. Tyler, you may have at it. <laughs> okay. It's, and then my two, um, two it's been tried, and I at this point I don't think that there's a, an appetite for it. Well, I think with the you know the recent budget climate, you know maybe appetites change over time, but I do think just to think two quick points that are related is I think we have to look at cost in a holistic sense, and I apologize if this has been already stated once this evening, is you can't just look at the dollar amount, right? You have to look at what do those dollars of not paying for this, what are the costs both in terms of, you know, monetary costs, but what are the other costs and loss of social capital and other things that help the town function and build that sense of community? You know, I think of like fireworks at the 4th of July, which we all, I hope everybody had a chance to enjoy last week. That's a great atmosphere. You know, my father actually, who's not really active and pays attention to a lot of stuff remarks like boy what a nice atmosphere it was down there with the music and the fireworks and what a great asset that is and that's something that a town could lean in on into is maybe f trying to find a way to make that more of a revenue generating activity for the town you know through some creative solutions so you can't just look at the dollars of, uh, spent again like you're cutting stat you know if you cut wages you cut other those things you're losing staff cost you more money in the loss of institutional knowledge than what you would gain and keeping it and to that end i'm not sure if you could put it in the budget but i really think the town should invest in doing a comprehensive wage study a prefer a professional one to see where we actually sit in terms of municipalities of a similar size so that way we can actually have an informed conversation that's been professionally done so here is where we actually stand next to our peers i know it's been done kind of anecdotally throughout this process i know eric did a little bit of it I know a few members of the community chimed in. They looked at, you know, listings on uh, seven days or the Vermont League of Cities and Towns to try and see, you know, where does our employees stack in that. But I think having a comprehensive one does kind of sets the groundwork. So we actually are, you know, it's not, you know, it, it, it's a quantitative fact at that point, not just, you know, subjective at that point. But that's that are my comments. And I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. It seems like we have a lot of information, and I'm wondering if we we schedule another meeting and then do some finalizing. How do you feel about that? I think we've yeah we've got a lot of information. So yep. Want to digest? Are we going to get any kind of input from the departments of? We could do that next just next, next you know, week, in case they miraculously come across something that you know. <coughs> You know, so, you know, or um, things that were exactly what we're talking about is that now that we're into the year, there's some things that we're, you know. Well, I would encourage us as liaisons to meet with our department heads yeah. and have that conversation. Yeah, I've met with mine, but yeah, I you know, just so that we get a big, everything's covered. So, so we're looking at uh, July 13th. I have down six o'clock. Oh, that's because we're having, there was going to be another meeting in here, but since there isn't, housing is not five thirty. That's right. The, the normal time, right? Yeah, five thirty. That's right. So, so we'll reconvene a budget meeting at five thirty on Thursday, July thirteenth. Do we need to have a put that in a motion? Um, Jason, no. um, we have a site visit 
Um, or there's going to be a public uh, hearing at the uh, Zoo Hamill Pit. Is that right? What date is that? The I believe that's the 17th. July 17th at 4 p.m. I didn't. <laughs> um, I thought I thought it was the tenth. It's not the tenth. The tenth is the training. I thought it was that and the other one. So yeah, it, was, it was before. Yeah. It was before the board meeting. So four thirty. At, at four p.m. Four p.m. Judy. Okay. All right. So we're on for this. Yeah, I think if we need one, yes. Oh, yes. I don't think. Okay. So next Thursday we'll continue the budget conversation. Yes, please. I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll second it. I have a motion to second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you.